I'm going to call the, the special meeting of the Board of Education to order. Um, there haven't been any questions submitted to mm -hmm. the, okay. Um, I just want to make a note that um, we are delaying this meeting till 930, primarily because we received notification from one of our board members who will not, can't, can't be here till 930, and we feel that this is really, really important, so um, we're delaying the meeting until she arrives. So, uh, call to order, uh, opening ceremonies. Uh, Michelle, would you uh, lead us in the pledge after a moment of reflection, please? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. Uh, roll call. Ms. Fleur? Here. Ms. Yelsey? Here. Ms. Black? Here. Ms. Anderson? Ms. Bartow? Here. Ms. Snell? Here. Ms. Matoye? Here. Dr. Navarro? Here. Okay. Um, Adoption of the agenda. Move adoption. Second. Okay. Um, I'm just wondering whether we should do anything for in recognition of the tragedy that's going on. Hmm. Uh, I, I move that we definitely um, adjourn this meeting in the names of all the tragic victims of the recent helicopter crash. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. Hey, we can so We will now recess into. There's no public comments, and we will uh, uh, recess into closed session until 9:30. By the way, I'll have to leave at 12:30. We're coming back in. We've already done the agenda, so we will reconvene and. Move to board workshop communication, Dr. Navarro. Yes, I'd like to introduce uh, Tony DeMarco, who is uh, one of our works with one of our works for one of our firms, uh, firms A A L R R, and uh, we asked Tony. We recruited him to come and uh, provide a communications workshop and update the board on all the regulations and some of the course, uh, some of the cases that have come out recently so that um, there are no breaches of, Bo of Brown Act vi violations. So, Mr. DeMarco. You want that one on? Sure. Okay. It would help. <laughs> oh, from back there? Okay. Uh, so good morning. Morning, I've had the morning. chance to say good morning to several of you. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, since I know what the first slide is, I can start talking about it. Oh, okay. turned on the oh, got it, got it. There we go. Dun, da, da, da. Dun, dun. All right, so here's the agenda of what we're going to go over. Um, I'm a lawyer, and so I do things from a legal perspective. I apologize for that. Um, <laughs> But you know, one of the one of the things that I get to bring into a, a workshop like this is I don't just work for your school district. I work for probably a dozen different school districts almost every day, and so I get to tell you what they're going through, and you're not going through that right now. And it's a way better illustration when I can tell you what a different district is doing, <laughs> what a different district is going through right now, especially when it's in the news. So one of the things that uh, I'm going to start with is to tell you about something that's been reported. I'm not betraying any confidences for my client. But uh, one of my clients, and you can Google this, is going through a pretty big issue right now. And it broke two days ago. So two days ago, what, was, what, what day of the week were we working on? Sunday. It's a Sunday, which is when all big stories happen. Yes. So we were working on Sunday because it came to light that uh, an allegation was made by the parents of a student that the student was, I'll say, roughed up by a teacher. Now, those are the allegations. They're serious allegations. Uh, it's a minority student in a predominantly Caucasian school district. This district has had uh, a lot of political issues going on in the past. You've read about them in the past whether it's litigation over praying at board member, uh, board meetings rather, oh. to other reasons that they've been in the news. Uh, they, have a, they have a quality board, they have a quality administration, 
and all of the board members want to weigh in on how this situation with the student should be handled. So we're talking about all kinds of different things today, but really the core of what we're talking about relates to situations like that, where you have strong board members who are just deeply invested in their community. You go to church, you go to the ball field, you work with the scouts, you do your shopping, and people ask you questions. They want answers from you, and you feel some obligation to them to share information, to show that you're doing their jo your job, that the district's doing its job, and that you care about them. When you end up with something in the news, the pressure is even greater. Mm -hmm. What is our response? What are you doing, administration? How can I help you do your job? Here are some <coughs> suggestions. I don't know if any of the other board members agree, but I think we should be going in this direction or that direction. Again, you guys have never been through this. This is something a different <laughs> district is going through, and that's why I use that as an example. Each of these two provisions of law, the Ralph M. Uh, Brown Act, which is our open meeting law, and the Public Records Act, are instructive on how, to, how you can handle these situations from a legal perspective. Um, I guess I'm fortunate to not know any specifics about your district where these have been a problem. So this is a cautionary tale, as opposed to preaching at you guys that you messed something up. Um, I also uh, w was deliberate when, when the superintendent asked me whether I could do a workshop like this, to say, I can talk about the law, but what are your local policies? And I understand that you have some draft protocols. Mm -hmm. They're not finalized, so I decided, why not take the opportunity to weigh in on them as you're developing them? So we'll, we'll do this as we go through. Any questions so far about the agenda? All right. So the Brown Act, uh, it's, it's not new law. It's been around for, for decades and decades, which is good because we have so much guidance about it. There's been a ton of litigation. There's a ton of practical examples. So we have the ability to say in certain situations, when this happens, here's how a court is likely to proceed. But because it's been around forever, people just assume they know what it says. And there's some foundational rules that we're going to go over that you may not have contemplated in the past, or at least not in any depth. So the, the, the basic rule is that the public's business is going to be conducted in front of the people. That's why we couldn't meet with uh, four or more of you on the seven-person board in a conference room to have this discussion. There's nothing confidential about this conversation. It doesn't fit with any of the exceptions to the public meeting law. So we have to do this in open session. Uh, when it says open and public, you know, the way that uh, technology is advancing, we have some districts who stream their board meetings. Um, obviously, you have to have an ADA compliant boardroom. These are all things that you don't think of uh, on a regular basis because it's so well established in your district. But just yesterday, I got a question for a board meeting last night on ADA, you know, Americans with Disability Act, accommodations at a board meeting. It was sort of new and novel. Uh, question for the for that board uh, it was actually the board secretary that called me and we were able to answer it but otherwise I mean you, you guys look at your setup you, you don't have to think about your boardroom you don't have to think about what uh, video cameras this has already been done it's established just one thing you might take for granted as far as a foundational rule would go uh, who does this apply to well you can read that the second I'll let you read that to yourself <coughs> that's pretty sweeping yeah really it's pretty sweeping who the, the, which entities, which legislative bodies the Brown Act applies to. So can you name one legislative body where the Brown Act absolutely does not apply? Yeah. To the state. <laughs> Assembly and yeah. Senate. It's to that group of people who in our this. legislature <laughs> that have said, here's all the rules that you are going to play by. It's also a list of rules that they don't play by. Right. Uh, we don't get a lot of questions about this because it's very obvious that the Brown Act applies to you. However, I, I don't know how active you guys are in creating blue ribbon committees or subcommittees of the board where a quorum of you, four of, uh, of you, may, may form a committee, uh, textbook review committee, for example. A lot of districts use standing committees for different things, whether it be property, human, uh, human resources, labor relations, um, textbooks, that, that type of thing where they're not going to convene all seven members of the board, 
but maybe a, a board majority of four will be on a committee. The Brown Act would still apply to those meetings. But if it's three, it yeah, doesn't. We do three. It's, it's always got to be, well, if it's a standing committee, the, depending on the makeup of the committee, we would likely conclude that the Brown Act applies as well. Dep it depends three. on what even kind of it's standing if, three? Even if it's only three of us? Yeah, because, well, and, and here's why. Um, when we say that the it may not be a meeting for the purposes of the Brown Act, there is also the right of public participation, uh, different rules that would apply for public participation, which would include any member of you that wants to attend the meeting. So let's say, hypothetically, we, we created the, uh, the, the textbook review committee, and three of you were on that committee, mm -hmm. but one of you wanted to go and attend that meeting. There's Brown Act provisions for that type of situation as well. Mm. So we, we, we can't just say, as a garden rule, garden variety, that the Brown Act doesn't apply. I actually handled a lawsuit where, on a seven-person board, two board members were on a committee, Two board members showed up to the committee, and the allegation was that they'd asked a question during the meeting. Mm. Was that a Brown Act violation? Okay, but you've got four there. I'm saying if there's only three and nobody else comes to listen or participate in any way, I don't even know that it's called a standing committee. It's also almost like a special like an ad hoc. Ad hoc. Yeah. yeah. So we should refer to it as ad hoc committee. You should. Okay. You should. And yeah. then we're okay. It's always going to be a quorum for you guys. So four people is one. And whether that's the, the notice meetings, you have to have a quorum, or a standing committee created by the board by any formal resolution or act, it's going to have to have a quorum. Um, participation in community meetings, if there's four of you, it could be an issue. Um, anytime four of mm -hmm. you get together and talk about anything within the district's jurisdiction, it's a mm -hmm. meeting. Anytime you have a meeting, it has to be noticed and all the Brown Act rules apply. So even if, because we had this come up the other day at yes. the, um, at the ch um, it's, a joint, bleh, it's a yeah. joint meeting of yeah. multiple agencies. And three of us participated, but one person just sat there and didn't participate. But that still would have, it was an it open me, meeting it now. Me, it would make me want to say. Yeah, um, don't do that. <laughs> It, well, or let's look more deeply into this yeah. and just ensure you're protected yeah. because yeah. the Brown Act even has provisions for having a quorum of the board president, present rather, at the meetings of, of another local agency. There are also Brown Act provisions for joint meetings of two local agencies. There's rules for about where those meetings can take place within district Ooh, boundaries. We need to know all that. But There's special yeah. rules for when you're allowed to meet outside of district boundaries. Very limited okay. rules when you can oh. do that. But, but by way of example, and this isn't an issue for you guys, but let's say you wanted to interview a superintendent candidate but talk to people on their home turf. Yeah. There's we, rules that apply for you to be able to go into a diff different we've district done that, yeah. and uh, have a quorum present. So there's all kinds of little minute, minute rules mm -hmm. that aren't necessarily covered here. Can you move closer to the mic so okay. it's recorded properly? Yep. Sorry about that. Or do you want or to elaborate? Ooh. Sure. I've never had a. I've, this is kept, Mark. What date and time? I've never been told I'm not loud enough. You're loud enough, but not for the the record, the recorded record. Got it. Uh, while while you're hooking up, <laughs> um, <laughs> if microphone. we're if we're yeah the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> it's early. Um, are we? When, if we're not the convener, thank you, convener of the meeting, do we, are we responsible for knowing that they have sent out public notice that the meeting has happened? For a joint meeting, we would, for a joint we meeting, we would both publish the agenda. Mm. Okay. Because they, they, they did, they did have public and they, they did have the agenda posted. Public. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, but there was only three of you that were, were, Official participants in that. Correct. Meeting. Correct. Um, so this slide gets to that last point. Um, it's uh, it used to be court court law uh, court um, uh, uh, courts had interpreted the Brown Act that you in order to violate this quorum rule uh, for for meetings outside of a, a agendized meeting they used to say that you had to rele reach some um, deliberate concurrence like a meeting of the minds on something otherwise you could be together. But that, that law has all been changed. Mm. Anytime there's four of you in a room, if you are not aware that you're at an agendized meeting of your board, you should probably, you should probably curtail what you're talking about it, and, and maybe not even talk to each other at all. <laughs> I, I just rendered uh, an opinion on that. Yeah, now I'm like moving from above. 
but I just rendered an opinion on that, which had to do with like a back to school night where a board majority was there. You just have to be cautious about, about your interactions. And it's not always your actual interactions. It's the perception mm -hmm. of four board members being in a room, four board members mm -hmm. talking to each other, huddled in a corner, you know, stand, standing at the bar, whatever that you guys would, would do t with each other at, at a meeting. So we have to go to it, this side of the room and to <laughs> that side of the room and never move. That would certainly avoid the perception that you may perhaps you're talking about something within your But jurisdiction. Harbor Council PTA, one per table. Any other questions? Mm. Okay, this is this is uh, where it gets more complicated, especially in the in the world of group texts, email oh. chains. Um, it used to be, you know, we would caution who you have coffee with in the morning and breakfast. So you can imagine that three of you or even two of you get together for coffee, and you're allowed at that uh, coffee, at that uh, interaction, to discuss anything you want within the board's jurisdiction because it's not a meeting, because there's fewer than four of you. However, if the three of you are at breakfast, and then Ashley tells Michelle what was discussed and who took which positions at coffee, all of a sudden, you've had a board meeting oh, God. and a violation of the Brown Act. Mm. Uh, now, it, I, I gotta say, back in the day, when we were at a coffee shop and having that, that conversation, there was no proof of what happened. Now, we do all those types of, of discussions. We have those discussions through text message, through email, through those types of things, so that there's a clear record of exactly what happened. And that's why we're gonna talk about the Public Records Act as well. We have to be, we have to be cognizant not only of what we say to each other, but um, even if it's just a one-on-one -on -one conversation, as that chain of conversation is passed one-to-one, one-to-two, one-to-three, you create a serial board meeting, and that could be a violation of the Brown Act. So I'm gonna have sort of a running story um, of a, a piece of litigation I was involved in. And it had <coughs> to do with uh, some members of the public <coughs> suing a school district, suing a board, alleging that a board majority had met outside of a board meeting and determined they were gonna hire their new superintendent. Hmm. It doesn't matter whether the allegations were true. The allegations were made in a lawsuit alleging violation of the Brown Act. I didn't handle this lawsuit. I wasn't able to represent uh, the district. I wasn't obviously representing the members of the community. I had nothing to do with that lawsuit, except I represent the district where that new superintendent had come from, their prior school district. The serial the evidence for that would be emails, text message, and then any oral testimony. So let's keep that in mind that we're not just talking about potentially um, oral communications, but the proof is the writing, the text messages, the emails. Does anybody use a fax machine anymore? No? I, I do. Know. We still have one. <laughs> the chat function in words with friends or anything like yeah. that. Oh. Uh, Instagram. Your, your Instagram, direct yeah. messages on Facebook, all those types of things are at play when Mm -hmm. uh -huh. <coughs> okay, so basic, basic um, uh, Brown Act requirements, also relating to written material. Any member of the public has the right to request all of the written documentation related to a meeting. Uh, we say agenda, an agenda packet, agenda backup, whatever it is that you have in front of you as a board member related to the agenda members of the public have the right to inspect that. Um, there is a 72-hour um, requirement for posting this type of stuff. Most of, most of what we do is, is we're able to post it because it, we know what we're going to do at that meeting. There are some things that we don't know what, what's going to happen with the document. The best example is I negotiate a lot of contracts for incoming superintendents. Um, even though I get direction from a school board on what they would like to see in the contract, the negotiations between the district and the superintendent take place between meetings. So I show up to another closed session of the board, I have no idea whether they're going to approve this draft contract. That's not going to be published 72 hours in advance. It's still a draft. 
I'm sometimes making changes to a contract all the way down to the time where the board takes the dais in open session. Those are situations where we distribute that finalized contract at the board meeting where it's going to be approved. Most of the time, we're going to post it um, in, in advance. Then does the public have a right to complain and say, how dare you do this? Are they legally correct in saying, you did not post this ahead of time, blah, 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 blah? Do they have the right to complain? Of course they do. <laughs> well, I think they can complain about anything. Um, but it, do, they have a legal, do they have the legal, would they have, are they legally uh, would, a case? Yeah, would they be able to uh, uh, Sue us. a Brown Act violation? Likely not. Okay. Likely not. But it would really depend on the facts of the situation and whether that document should have been available when we posted our agenda. Okay. Okay, so I have a question because you said um, draft in there. Are you saying anything that's a draft does not have to be published? Well, the draft superintendent's contract. I know, sure, you were, yeah, you were. Because yeah. I'm literally going in there and saying, for example, the superintendent says that they absolutely will not, the, the, the incoming superintendent absolutely will not join your district mm -hmm. unless the evaluation article says X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. well, if we published a draft, it betrays some of the deliberative process of that negotiation. Now, a draft board policy, yeah. for example, let's yeah. say you're revising your board policy yeah. on mm -hmm. technology, mm -hmm. that should probably be posted. So okay, that so that's that's not a problem. Because that's the type of thing where we're going to bring the board policy forward, and the board meeting is designed for you to publicly give us feedback on the right. draft policy. Okay. Do you guys do first readings and second readings? Most yeah. Of the time. yeah. Sometimes we do it in one, so, if there's but, no questions. But, but the process is intended to be public, mm -hmm. and if we can do two readings of it, we even will, so that there could be more public but we have an ad hoc committee that reviews the policies that need to be updated or created. That, okay. that then it comes. First. Then it comes to everyone to discuss. That's fine. But okay. It's probably included with the agenda packet. If, yep. If we've got it is. Yes. yes. It is. Yeah, it uh, is. One more question. Yes. Um, Seventy-two hours. Um, yes. Isn't there um, uh, some? If it's an emergency, That's twenty-four. Special meeting, Next yeah. 24 hours. Uh, okay. An emergency meeting is something different, and you know, we could talk about it briefly, but my strong preference is if you think you have to have an emergency meeting, to call me so I can help okay. you with it. Okay. An emergency meeting would be an act of God or something of that type, where yeah. you literally have to get together right now. Mm -hmm. And the, the basic way to explain it is it's, it's backwards. You have the meeting, and then you publish what, what you What happened. Mm -hmm. Okay. But the, there have been very few circumstances when we thought we needed uh, an emergency meeting. The, the paradise, it, uh, fire, um, right? Mm -hmm. That would be an example of you guys needing to get together immediately to figure out how you're going to educate the thousands of kiddos mm -hmm. when all your schools are gone. Mm -hmm. other, than, other than that, there's very limited circumstances where I think you would need uh, a, an emergency meeting. It'd be something like that. Emergency meeting different than a special meeting. Special uh, meeting. Perfect. Uh, so the, the, the difference between regular meetings we, uh, and special meetings, we focus on the number of hours to publish the agenda. But really, the regular meetings are those ones that you decide you're going to have mm -hmm. in December. Mm -hmm. Therefore, there's a, you're, you have to have 72-hour mm -hmm. notice. You should know what, what you're going to do at those meetings. Mm -hmm. A special meeting, those pop up all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's only a 24-hour notice. And the rules are, are different for how you conduct uh, a regular meeting versus a special meeting. Um, not to harp on superintendent contracts, but the Brown Act says that there's certain things you can't do at a special meeting. And one would be to approve the contract of the superintendent. And we'll, and we'll, we'll go through those. But things. Th Which makes sense. So, and does that apply to study sessions too, like this? Is this considered a special meeting? Or is this, mm -hmm. uh, and we, we only had to do post it 72, uh, 24 hours in advance? I don't mm -hmm. know how many hours you posted it. We posted you could a have lot. done as few as seven. We did, 70, we did 72. We err on the side of doing it longer. <laughs> does not turn this into a regular meeting, though. No, no. Just because you did the seven oh, okay. two hours, right? So cool. we still couldn't approve the superintendent's contract at this meeting. Not a problem. Uh, so, like we said, the notice of special meeting is a twenty-four hour um, notice, and that rule I just described to you is right there. Um, what, with the government code thirty-five eleven dot one right there, the, it says that uh, the, the law governs is the government code. It's not unique <coughs> to school districts. And so it refers to executives of local agencies. And when you look at that government code section and apply it to school districts, it's, a basic, it's basically the superintendent and his cabinet. And if we're out of the cabinet, we're getting down to 
directors or, or principals, something like that. I don't even know that they have separate contracts, but then we're more comfortable with them going forward, preferably at a regular meeting. But if you had to do a special, I would not approve any, uh, any contracts for a cabinet member. I Got would, it. I would give them local agency. Uh, public participation, I know you guys are familiar with this, but uh, different boards have different rules. It's very common for boards to give three or five minutes to each speaker. Um, there's an interesting aside right now uh, based on some interaction in a South County, uh, a North San Diego County, sorry, school district that got a nasty gram from the ACLU. And you guys, I think, will, will appreciate this. They, they had their board meetings. And that board, I believe, gave 30 minutes for public comment. Oh, wow. And three minutes per person. And if there were 10 speakers, then it worked out perfectly. If there were 100 speakers, they would say, we've already done our 30 minutes, sorry, no more public comment. The ACLU took issue with that. I actually would, would recommend against that type of rule. Um, the ACLU took a very interesting stance, though. So this is not in the law anymore. But they said, we would prefer you give a hundred speakers one minute hmm. than only ten speakers three minutes because they want as many different people to be heard as possible. That probably is good policy. It's not grounded in the law anywhere. But definitely curtailing uh, the total public comment to only 30 minutes when you've got a hundred speakers raises the issue of whether you're, you're actually allowing for public participation. Hmm. On the flip side of that, giving a hundred speakers three minutes each calls into question of whether you're allowing <laughs> public participation. Because when it's midnight and you're still in public comment, and then you start your regular agenda, that calls into question whether all those people who want to see you conduct business mm -hmm. are being mm -hmm. um, you know, forced to leave because they got work or school mm -hmm. the next day. So it's a balancing test. Mm -hmm. And the courts have said as long as the rule that you come up with is reasonable, they'll defer to you. So if you reduce the per speaker, down to one minute, if you extend to an hour or something like that, a court would likely find you're acting reasonable in light, light of the circumstances and endorse your process. So, Tony, on, in that, um, how many opportunities of public participation are, I mean, is it one that we have to have at least one? Or can you have more than one? Or, and where's the placement of it? I think I understand the question. And the, and the, the answer is you get a choice. The only, the only requirement is that you give the public the right to participate either before or during the consideration of an item. Okay. So different boards do things different ways. Some mm -hmm. have public comment, and then they're done, and they go about their agenda. Some have that general public comment on non-agenda items that you do at regular meetings. Mm -hmm. And then if speakers identify the topic on the agenda they want to speak to, they call the speakers at that time. And the law doesn't have a preference for what you do. Oddly enough, at the, at the community college district level, the law does have a preference. You, you do it commensurate with the agenda item. Mm -hmm. But at the K-12, mm -hmm. you get to pick. Do, do you know, what is your practice? We have to keep switching it around, but right now it's non-agenda items are at the beginning. We have two. We have one at closed session. They can comment on closed session. Mm -hmm. Then non-agenda items before, and then agenda item, then go down that way. But sometimes they'll just say, we want to speak. They'll at the speak beginning. at the beginning, and then they'll walk out. <laughs> so they don't want anyone to hear, you know, they just don't want to hear anything. They don't want to hear the deliberative process yeah. on that specific agenda item. So, so it's all over the board. There's nothing wrong with your practice that, okay. you, that you just mm -hmm. described um, for, for regular meetings. Remember, at special meetings, the public comment is limited to agenda items. So the only thing is at a special meeting, you don't call for public comment on non-agenda items. Mm -hmm. You may, oh, okay. but you're not required to. Oh, okay. Good to know. Good to know. Good. Um, this, this slide, this topic frequently surprises board members. Mm -hmm. uh, so just take a second to digest. Re really, that, that first and second um, dash, I think, are the, the two that surprise board members. Oh, see, I wasn't. So it's, it's kind of peculiar, is it not? Mm -hmm. that if you're in a grocery store and somebody asks you a question, most board members would think, well, I can, mm -hmm. I can just talk about this all I want. Mm -hmm. Yet if you're at an agendized public meeting with video streaming, 
The law says you're truncated in your responses. You may briefly respond to questions. Um, you may ask clarifying questions. But mostly, I think the law, the, the intent is that you refer it back to staff. Yeah, because uh, we don't even do those first two. We we're, we're cautioned not to even respond. Just sit there. Probably thank, you yeah. <laughs> thank you for sharing. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Probably a best practice. Yeah. Um, with the clarifying questions and the directions to staff. Um, yeah, we'll we do that. Typically, get you where you want, anyways. Which yeah. is, you want members of the public to know that they were heard, and you want to hold your staff accountable to answering their questions on your behalf. That's that's kind of the way the Brown Act is set up. You can see it wants you to defer. You're only allowed to briefly respond and pose some clarifying questions. Any other questions about that? Mm -mm. Brief questions, clarifying questions? <laughs> I'll refer to the Fred anyway. That's right. <laughs> OK, uh, the report out, again, this is, uh, the, the, the Brown Act doesn't change often, often, but in the last couple of years, it seems like we've got some Ooh. good ones. Pretty much any vote now, just as a matter of practice, just do a roll call vote. That's your safest approach. Remember, it changed in closed session a couple years back where all closed session votes were roll call. Now there is just a trend toward roll call voting. Mm. Uh, oh. So I know it's a little so bit So consent more calendar, you, you roll call the whole consent calendar? Consent calendar, we typically roll call anyways, right? Um, no. 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 So yeah, from now on, we will we'll roll call the, the, okay. the consent calendar. We'll roll call pretty much any vote now. That's mm -hmm. going to be the baseline. Okie dokie. I think that's a good idea. Because well, sometimes I, I don't say I because I'm looking at something. And <laughs> and then, okay. But see, yeah, because it's kind of weird yeah. because we call for the vote. We have eyes, yes and no's. But then on the agenda, that through Agenda Online, Sherry does make note of everybody's okay. vote. But it's not, she, we don't call, we don't have, Sherry doesn't call and say, everybody's name. So I you're suggesting that that's the best yeah. process? Yeah. Err on the side of caution. I like that. We'll just have a process where when the, when the chair calls for a vote, we'll start with uh, probably Char and work our way across mm -hmm. until we've recorded everybody's mm -hmm. name. And then we'll move on. Okay. This, no, and Sherry calls it? Let's not start with Char. Anybody can no, call it. No, okay. we would call no, it. The and then she would. Okay. 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 And then whoever who wants to say the last name. I'm going to have you guys all put buttons up. We're going to change the buttons and just so push the button. Some, <laughs> some school districts where the, I attend their board meetings regularly do have a voting pra, uh, system where they push an I or an A or an abstain and it reports it on the. We like Congress. <laughs> kind of like to let you yeah. know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, if it gets just too cumbersome to mm -hmm. call votes each time, you mm -hmm. have to about some sort of. It's really not going to be. Okay, yeah. perfect. We don't vote on that much stuff. No. Now, um, we're, we're talking about redoing the student board member program where they w might, could possibly have a provisional vote. So would they be part of that? Yeah. Okay. Roll call vote, and they're typically first. Okay. Uh -huh. um, so recording. For some reason, I'm getting a lot of questions about recording. I think it has to do with the fact that everybody's got a cell phone with a video mm -hmm. camera on it now. Uh, yeah. Recording public meetings is totally appropriate. And the only the only caveat would be <laughs> sorry. <laughs> uh, the only caveat would be that they need to do it from the back of the room or some other location where they're not going to obstruct the view of other participants. Ah. So they can't stand up in the middle. They can't walk right. in the well. Um, they they have to stay toward the back. Now, media outlets are typically respectful of this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, where we've been running into issues is just a, a member of the public that, for whatever reason, wants to record all your meetings and post them to YouTube. Yeah. Uh -huh. They have to stand toward the back of the room. They just can't disrupt the participation of others. Can we can we set uh -huh. aside space for them? Yeah, and, a, and ask them to sit in in specific. Yeah. As, lo as long as they're able to you know, reasonably video, don't put it behind a pole or a door <laughs> or anything like that. But yeah. Just, outside. There you go. Outside. Yeah. Outside. Through, the Through the windows. Through the windows. I mean, you're fortunate in that your boardroom is not so large that that you can't accommodate them somewhere. Mm -hmm. okay. from. So how does this play into streaming? I mean, if they can record it and we're not streaming our meetings, like what's how? How do we how explain do we, that? Yeah. How do we? You mm -hmm. know. Well, we aren't streaming. Uh, we but actually learned that Spectrum broadcasts our meetings. Live. While they're in, li while they're live, it's not us streaming, but we have Spectrum has. I know. 
a, yes. a channel that they are showing airing our meetings live. Twenty six. Yes, we we, talk, we talked about this before, but it was um, we can, like we decided that mm -hmm. that was what was happening. But more, my question was, uh, that's not always offered. You know what I mean? If there's, it can be preempted by something else. Um, my concern is how we navigate what the correct legal way of doing things is. If someone else can stand there and stream ours, but we're not offering that access. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Because we have to have it translated and closed captioned before we can publicize it. Right. And we're yeah. good at it. Okay. So, so does yeah. it affect that? I'm sorry? So, so no, if, 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 if someone else is taking your video and streaming it. It's I, not our. They don't take our video. They take their video. Right. They, yeah, I wouldn't, that, that really has nothing to do with the discourse. But if. <laughs> oh, well. But if. Okay. I, what I think Michelle is asking is sometimes spectrum Something else may circumvent, right. pre prevent. You know, public is expecting the streaming. Um, streaming. That's not. They're doing it as a public oh. service. It's not part of us because we have to. We're, we're translating. Ours is the official record and it's translated. But Spectrum is doing it for one side of the city, not the other side. Depends on what where you live, where you live, or if you have Spectrum. and if it's live or whatever. So. If they don't show it, do we get into trouble? Are we getting into trouble? No. And it's not streamed. It's oh, broadcast. Right. 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 It's televised. So it's not on the internet. It's on the cable. So I, I don't know if that makes a difference or not. But yes, it is Costa Mesa, and it's not Newport Beach. And if city council does it at the same time we do, they probably preempt us for city council. City council's done it. In Newport, it's city council. But I can't believe you guys get preempted. The stuff is so exciting. <laughs> oh, city council is way more exciting than we are. <laughs> uh, okay, so um, we're not going to go into detail about all the closed sessions because there's too many of them. But you know, before you adjourn into closed sessions, you say to the people, here's what we're going to talk about. In general terms, you're going to refer to the agenda, for example, uh, uh, agenda item 4A, uh, hmm. public employee do that. discipline dismissal release. So if that's all you had on your closed session agenda, then you could go in there and talk about employee discipline. Okay, because okay, we don't do that. No, we just say we, we're, so, we're moving yeah. into closed session. Okay, so we but should just state should, it. Should, you uh, want us to we're say it. What we're going to do in closed session. Okay. Oh, okay. Right. Oh, boy. Everything. Just, just, just the agenda items. Just the agenda items. Mm -hmm. Moving into closed session to discuss items one, two, three, yep. personnel. What? So common yeah. practice is to have it uh, displayed, the closed session. Uh, agenda items and just to have whoever is going to make the announcement saying item one conference with labor negotiator the designated negotiator is okay superintendent Barr. item two litigation advice uh, counsel Got it. one case or the case number that type of thing these are the these are the most popular closed session uh, agenda items there's there's actually a code section that lists what are called the safe harbor rules and what the legislature has said is if you're going into closed session to, let's just go with number two, uh, to talk about personnel, then here is the language that you would use. And it's, it's a public employee discipline dismissal release. Mm -hmm. If you use that and then go into closed session and talk about personnel, you're okay. The legislature has said that's okay. Mm -hmm. But remember, the Brown Act is a government code applicable to all legislative bodies. Except them. They, they except for themselves. The, 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 uh, the gaps that we have to fill typically deal with students. Yes. Okay, I was so going to ask you that. there's ed code that allows us to talk about student issues in closed session. But there's none of these safe harbor provisions. We have to make up our own. So what, what this slide illustrates with this conversation underscores is that there are good, valid reasons to go into closed session that are unrelated to any of the, what the legislature said are safe harbors. Hmm. That's something that legal counsel would help you with. We would say, here is an appropriate closed session item for tonight. Uh, grade challenges, mm -hmm. um, complaints by students, not necessarily against employees, because we can go in for sure, complaints against mm -hmm. employees, we know that. But what about student uh, student complaints that are being resolved? So we, we craft, I would say make up or fabricate, but we craft those closed session items for you so that you can still go into closed session. If we were going to list, because there's five things there, and we made,
for example, a sixth bullet that said students, and over on the side where it says government code, blah, 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 blah we put ed code, blah, 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 is that appropriate? Yeah, we, okay. we have one for, for that, for oh, student okay, discipline good. and stuff like that. Good. Um, where I thought you were going, it's probably worth exploring a little bit, is oh. what if we just put every Brown Act closed session <laughs> agenda item on every agenda? Is that okay? And the, oh, that the answer is probably not. Uh, <laughs> many districts think that have, the, that have these placeholders on just lets them go into closed session for everything that they want to talk about, and that's not the rule. Now, we've received criticism from opposing counsel or open meeting advocates, because <coughs> most school districts, especially of your size, will have discipline dismissal release on every agenda. Because you, you don't know what's going to come up between yeah. you and the board meeting, so you just have it as a standing agenda item. And I think that's okay. I think that's actually preferable than waiting another month or however long between meetings for you guys to consider uh, disciplinary action against an employee or talk about an employee issue. So, but on the other hand, if you're not selling a piece of property, I probably wouldn't use that <laughs> citation for every closed session. Got it. I'd be judicious with that one. Huh. All right. Closed sessions are intended to be confidential with almost, we can say limited, but there's almost no exceptions to this rule. And it, it actually, and we'll go into this in a little more detail, there could be criminal action against a board member for disclosing confidential communications from closed sessions. Uh, you can see what, what the, the definition is of confidential information. So if we go in under discipline dismissal release, you cannot talk about what's, what's being discussed about that employee discipline. If we go in under real property, you can't talk about what was discussed about the real property. Uh, and that works for labor negotiations, that works for record changes for students, grade challenges, complaints. What happens in closed session stays in closed session. Here's uh, among the items that could happen for violations of closed session. Uh, I've actually only ever been a part of one uh, injunctive relief uh, by way of a settlement agreement. One of my clients, it's actually the way I started working with the school district, <laughs> was under a settlement agreement with the district attorney's office after a grand jury inquiry. And they admitted to Brown Act violations, and as part of the settlement agreement, among other things, they had to agree to record every closed session mm. and have uh, legal counsel familiar with the Brown Act at every meeting. So for the better part of a, of a year, I attended every single board meeting, every single close. I sat through employee recognitions. <laughs> I knew more about how seven board members could obsess about a pool at a school than I thought was ever possible. I sat through it all. I was also in closed session when the board president asked me, Tony, yes, has our settlement agreement with the district attorney expired? Yes. And do we have to record closed sessions now? No. Uh, are you required to be present? No. Turned off the recorder and said, you can go. Bye-bye. <laughs> 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 uh, so I actually made it to Monday Night Football. Uh, it was like the first time of the year. Woo. Football season. Woo. So um, you really want to avoid uh, interacting with your grand jury. There's very few positive interactions you can have with the, as a board member with the grand jury. Uh, the district attorney runs that, a process, that process. It's, it's very one-sided, and it can, be, it, it can be extremely uncomfortable for you as representatives of the district. So let's avoid it. I have a question. Yes. I'm trying to figure out how to phrase this. Let's say that um, one of your closed session, I'm gonna, I'm gonna come up with a closed session item that is, isn't really a closed session item, just okay. to make my point, which is, okay, the closed session item is um, what color to paint a school. And, um, but um, you're having issues with what color to paint the school, and the public is wondering why you have met 47 times on, on what, how, what color to paint the school. But what you've actually been doing is um, figuring out what to paint all the schools. 
but painting of the schools is a closed session item. So can you say to the public, um, we realize, because the public's now asking, why do you keep meeting about this? Can we say, oh, well, we're redoing the whole color scheme of the whole school? The, uh, is so when you're, when you're, <laughs> when you're in closed session, uh -huh. um, and you come back into open session, yeah. you're actually required to report out your, any action taken, right? Right. Uh, but we, always, we don't always take a reportable action. action. Right. right. There's not always going to be that roll call vote. Right. But we, I have been part of closed sessions where the board, which when you say we, I the board be at least four of you that yeah. want to do something. Yeah. Right? Because you can't act alone. Right. When four board members want to give a status report, if you will, to the community, we do it by way of the report out. So there is a way that you could craft the report out. Okay. Without violating the okay. ground. That's, you answered and my question. Just yeah. staying within your hypothetical, Yeah. it would be something like in closed session, mm -hmm. the, reboard, the board reviewed color samples mm -hmm. from multiple mm -hmm. paint providers mm -hmm. and gave direction to staff mm -hmm. on the appropriate palette for each school in the, in the, in the, in the Perfect. Or okay. something like that. Something like that. And then we're going to come back and vote on it in open session. <laughs> you future well, I don't but know. If, no. Uh, according to yeah. Vicki, we're allowed to talk about painting. Yeah. So yeah. It's like it's just a sample. Yeah. And you can in the apply that. You can apply that to any the hypothetical the, world. You know, the real closed section. And let's, let's say you were in there to talk about threats to public safety. Um, uh, the, yeah. You know the the peninsula, mm -hmm. the global climate change, mm -hmm. raising the water. Mm -hmm. What is the name of the Beautiful school that has the Newport best L Newport, L Newport L Elementary. Uh, yeah. So what are you gonna do about that flavor? Yeah. And the public's waiting for you. Waiting yeah. for you. Waiting yeah. for it. It's a threat to public safety. You could report out incrementally what you did. Yeah. Without running a running a foul. Okay. Okay. Does that make enough sense? And without and without getting into specifics, like take the painting example, uh, we're deciding between green or red. You know, we're not. It's not because this is closed session item, yeah. and you really may never be able to report out exactly what it's took possible. place. So, it's okay, I, I, you've answered my questions. Yeah. My, yeah. Um, you may be thinking to yourself, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. "Wow." Tony's focusing on a bunch of minutia. It's not a big deal in our district. We don't have these problems. We're never going to have these problems. So oh we gosh. embedded into the materials that you have a couple of links that you may want to take a look at, huh. especially that first one. Now, that we were talking about the 72-hour rule and drafts, et cetera. Uh, if, you, if you track down that... Um, that was it the New York Times or the Washington World <laughs> No, it was the Acorn, uh, a local newspaper up, up in, I think, the San Gabriel Valley. But, okay, so you have the local newspaper who oversaw, or, or saw, rather, a, 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 a member of the board, or I can't remember, a staff person, making copies of an updated document. And the reporter said, oh, it's on the agenda for tonight. Can I have a copy? And the response was, you can't have it until the board has it. Mm. Okay. Maybe that's legally true because, I, like I just told you with the draft superintendent mm -hmm. contract, mm -hmm. I can see that being an appropriate response in certain circumstances. But then it was disseminated to the board and not the members of the public. Mm. And the ACORN wanted it. And that's when the, the article picks up. So. You don't want to be in the news for violation of the Brown Act, even something ticky-tacky mm -hmm. like that. Um, mm -hmm. We have up there uh, replying to all. It's, it's just too common. Um, and we're going to get into other issues about that. But you know, re the reply to all, if you do anything more than say, I've got it, or you know, acknowledging receipt, if you give direction to the board, or we had a really interesting example. I did a similar workshop at CSBA, and one of the one of the people, the attorneys on the panel, brought up this issue of electricity is out at a school site, and board members, in her hypothetical, start replying to the super, hypothetical superintendent, "Go rent a generator." 
Go get mm. porta potties. Go get this. Go get that. Well, respectfully, that's not your job on an email. That's not where you give direction to a superintendent in front of others. Mm -hmm. If you want to give direction to a superintendent individually, you can work that out with your superintendent. But you don't reply all on an email. Huh. And so in her hypothetical, that led to a, to a meeting that was uh, unlawful. A question? Yeah. Go ahead. Unless you wanted to. That's probably the same. So we get a notification that says, just want to let you know all five schools have been made distinguished schools and we, we've we gotten really good at going received, but typically we would go, how fabulous, how great, how wonderful. Are That's okay. Th those are fine. Yeah. Okay. What wouldn't be fine is, in my opinion, this is a, a inappropriate designation for work that was done by a prior principal. Yeah, yeah. No. Fred, I want you to do an investigation of this, that. It's, it's the but emotional point. responses are typically okay. Yeah, as long as it's an clean. emoji, let's say. Yes. It's even know. better. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Or now my kids were really excited to see that I actually <coughs> have an emoji. Yeah. Mm. It doesn't take a lot of time. It's no. not like I obsessed over the hair or anything. Yeah. Okay. yeah. <laughs> so uh, we kind of went over all of this stuff. But okay, I have one more question. Uh -oh. I'm sorry. Okay. I have one more question. Um, yep. I, I'm sure this is okay. We get a lot of invitations from um, the superintendent's office. You've been invited to this or that. <laughs> And we do a reply all so other people know who's going. Calendaring isn't. It's fine. Yeah, okay. calendaring is Sorry. not a big issue. Okay. You're going to get emails. Are you available on such and such date, yeah. such and such time? That's for okay. For a special meeting. Okay. Um, all of those, again, we're going to talk about the PRA, are accessible to the public. You have to understand that um, as, as part of the cautionary tale of, of this yeah. workshop. Uh, so if you are alleged to have violated the Brown Act, which will happen, I mean, let's think about the ACORN article, right? That was just a minor thing. Mm -hmm. You're going to get a demand to cure effect. And we can almost always figure out a good way to cure and correct that violation. Almost always. Uh, the, the board majority that went to a subcommittee meeting and spoke, the cure and correct, we can't undo the speaking of, of the quorum at that subcommittee meeting, but we can say... Our fault, our bad, mm -hmm. it won't happen again. Mm -hmm. okay, we own up to the mistake and promise it won't happen again. Uh, it gets a little bit more difficult if what you are, like the, the case that I was referring to in, it's, it's in Poway, it's public information, right? It's a lawsuit mm -hmm. uh, where the allegation is that there was a meeting, a, a quorum to hire a superintendent. It's kind of hard to unring hiring a superintendent when she's <laughs> been there for a couple years. So the litigation's <laughs> still going on, right? But we can fix almost any of the inadvertent uh, low stakes Brown Act violations. And it could, it could happen. And the way we do it is, is through the cure and correct. If we cure and correct correctly, they can't file a Brown Act lawsuit. If they file a Brown Act lawsuit and they win, then they get attorney's fees. And potentially the district attorney can get involved, do witness interviews, obtain documentation, present it to the grand jury, and uh, it's possible that there could be uh, a violation of this government code section, willful omission to perform duty enjoined by law, and it's a misdemeanor. Things we typically like to avoid. All right, so let's segue into the Public Records Act, and we're only going to talk about the PRA as it really affects the Brown Act and the public's business. Mm -hmm. We're not going to get into the minutia. But mm -hmm. you have to understand that every single document retained by a school district is a public record. There's um, a, a broad, I mean, look how sweeping this, 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 this definition is. Uh, any electronic record, uh, any, very common now for voicemails when they're left on a system to be attachments to emails. So voicemails are public records. Video recordings from uh, security cameras are, are, are public records. Now there's nuance to security type apparatus that we have to go through. But you have to assume everything done within a school district is going to be subject to disclosure to the public. So the only two distinctions for public records, because everything is a public record, is whether it's disclosable or non-disclosable. Non-disclosable records are pretty much what you would think they would be. If one of your attorneys writes a legal opinion <coughs> that is protected by the attorney-client privilege, it's a non-disclosable public record. Uh, if you have a request for student records, 
you can tell a member of the public those are protected by state and federal law, FERPA. Uh, if you have uh, someone trying to get to documents that are only closed session items, personnel related, those are not going to be disclosable public records. Uh, disclosable public records, the easy ones are, we still get requests for our board policies. We refer to people to online. Uh, executive contracts, um, but a big one right now are email communications. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, I had a big request that many, many school districts who are affiliated with CTA received, and that was a demand for public records related to Janus. Mm -hmm. They wanted to know post Janus, what kind of communications did the district have with, with CTA? Yeah. So there's no protection for those under the law. So in some cases that were reported, I read them on, online, uh, that there was a communication where the CTA president would email the assistant superintendent for HR and say, hey, I need you to block any and all emails coming from this organization, either a pro-Janus or anti-Janus organization. That's now a public record and disclosable. So, um, and that's a, that's a violation, right? Of I mean, blocking. And block, blocking. you can't. It could be. It depends on what your policy says. Okay. okay. Um, the, the, the email system is for the public's business. And uh, if you regulate what types of emails can come into your system, then you can say if it doesn't have to do with students or parents, it's the public's okay. business. We're going to block it. It's from, we get solicitations for financial institutions all the time. Mm -hmm. Give us all of your email addresses and tell us how much this person makes. <laughs> so they can determine who they contact for financial funding. And we try to push back on those a little bit because that's not what emails are okay. for. Um, it doesn't matter where a document is stored. If it's in a file in the district office, if it's on a local computer at a school site, or sometimes surprisingly, even if it's on your personal cell phone, your home computer, your personal devices, it can still be a public record. Even if you have a work phone and a private phone. They're so if you everything. have a work phone and you only do work on that phone and you have a personal phone and you never do district business on that personal phone, then there should be no public records on that personal phone. But could they ask to see if you do any personal? Uh, you're, you're jumping ahead in I'm the presentation. <laughs> <laughs> we only got three minutes. Okay. Three minutes. Goodness gracious. Okay. Uh, so this is the question in Orange County that you have to ask yourself when you write something, either via text or email. Yeah, really. And that is, do I want this published in the register? Because guess what? The register will ask for it, and it could be published in the register. So be diligent about what you put in your writing, including hooray for blue ribbon. You know, watch your emojis. Yeah. Like I said, yeah. some of those can be misinterpreted. Mm -hmm. All right. All uh, right. It's not every single communication. Uh, it has to be related to district business. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you're uh, just complimenting somebody on their suit <laughs> or their tie or their hair, that's not going to be disclosable. Okay. Go ahead and compliment me on any of those via text. <laughs> email, I don't care how you compliment me. I'll take it. Uh, and you guys have that Titan program, right? Mm -hmm. But the question is going to be, should, should I write in this, should I give direction, should I express this opinion? Because that's a public, that's a public document as well. So be mindful of everything that you write. So Titan's a public document? Mm -hmm. Anything, yeah, anything retained by, by the district. Any communication, no matter what device or where it's stored, is a public record. But if it's on your own, um, we, you know, we all have our personal emails. <coughs> So if uh, you use your personal email to conduct district business, it would still be a public record. So, I, and I have gotten requests from, uh, from my personal emails before, but um, if, you know, I erase what little I do on there regularly, so. Most people, I know personal devices, you're, you erase text messages and stuff. Yeah, you just don't pick no, device. no. The, the, the law is not going to concern itself with whether you have a practice of deleting your text messages and your emails. Okay. The question is, once that request comes in, if you still have a copy of that email mm -hmm. on your personal device, 
it's a public record and you have to turn okay. it over. Okay, yeah, I understood that. Okay, okay good. I just so want to clarify. And that, yeah. that actually is a really good segue to both what uh, oh, good. both of you have brought up so far. And that okay. is, um, can you really get access to this stuff? Well, mm -hmm. let's, let's make sure we know the difference between a public records request, which is totally within the control of, of the district, and uh, litigation, which includes the power of attorneys and subpoena. Uh, that same Poway case, so I work with, with the district from which mm -hmm. that superintendent came. And in that litigation between Poway, uh, fi filed against their, uh, the community filed it against them, they had subpoena authority. So they sent to my client a request for all kinds of information. Okay. That's separate from their PRA request. So they have a PRA to my district mm -hmm. that says, give us all this information. Mm -hmm. So the, the superintendent in that district sat down and she worked with her director of IT and principals and gathered all of this information, including text messages on personal devices, and turned them over to the requesting party. And she felt like she did a pretty darn good job. Then this subpoena comes in and requests very similar documents, but not precisely the same documents, which sent her through different search items. One record that she found as a response to the subpoena was a calendar item. You know how those things come out to get mm -hmm. stuff on your calendar? That she had not provided as part of the PRA. And the court, when this group filed a PRA lawsuit against my client, said, that's enough. That one record that should have been respond, uh, responsive to the PRA means you violated the Public Records Act. And so as part of that lawsuit, my client had to pay that attorney uh, their attorney's fees. If she found it later, when she did the subpoena and said, oh, I wonder if I should put that to them, and she sent it to them then? She did, yeah. She, she did her best good faith uh, response to both. Mm -hmm. And that one record mm -hmm. that was arguably related to the PRA was deemed enough to have been a violation of the, of the public. Even if she sent it after? She sent Later. It for, for result, for result she sent it for the result she, subpoena, but she, she didn't include it because it wasn't specific enough. And I understand that, but what if when she found it in the subpoena, she turned around and sent it to the public person that she said and said, I, in doing another search, I found this and sent it to them? Trust me, we tried everything. Got it. <laughs> okay. So the, the moral of the story is yes. just because we can say no to something on a PRA. Yeah. If it's a, and I've, I've got all kinds of horror stories where, where yeah. the district had sent an email, they couldn't find it on their side, but the person on the other side found it and disclosed no. it, but they didn't. So be mindful of <laughs> mm -hmm. what you put into, into writing, no matter what it is. Uh, some of the distinctions between a uh, PRA and a subpoena uh, that you can re review for yourself. So obviously there's hiccups associated with the PRA, we really have PRA workshops <laughs> that we do. Um, but these are just some of them. So um, the, the remedy here would be a lawsuit. Again, there's penalties, including paying the attorney's fees of whoever had to bring the lawsuit. All right, so I, I asked for standards on communication, this type of thing, and I was provided a draft of a governance handbook that you guys are apparently considering, so I just wanted to weigh in mm -hmm. on a few of those things. Um, these can really, to me, help control what you put in writing. And if you're, if you're being mindful of some of these rules, if you in, in, in intend to adopt them as norms, then you can really avoid a lot of trouble. So the ba basic purpose of working together, uh, I think, is pretty straightforward. And if that's part of what controls what you put into writing as well, I think you'll be in pretty good shape. Um, it has in there maintaining confidentiality of closed session. Um, you know, I saw attacking, you know, not attacking uh, mm -hmm. people, attacking the issues is part of the, on the problem, not on the people. Those help control what you put into writing as well. I know this probably intended to be oral communications, but mm -hmm. uh, speaking with a common voice, that's a big deal because, uh. like I said, under the Brown Act, you're sort of constrained of how you can respond even at a public meeting. Uh, and when you're, uh, when you're speaking outside of a public meeting, there's a question, are you speaking on behalf of the board or as an individual? Is this on behalf of a majority? Because we can only act by a majority, uh, majority vote. Uh, so um, a com common example, and again, I don't know if this has happened to you guys, but I've been asked about board members showing up at school sites, demanding to review personal rec personnel records. You guys, you don't have that authority. 
Uh, just on personnel records, for example, if you want to review a personnel file, the place that you do that is in closed session. You have the uh, quorum, the board president, can direct the superintendent to bring something into closed session. That's where you have the authority to act, when you're acting before the, you guys only have to count to four. Right? <laughs> yeah. you have to count to four on anything, then you can tell the, the administration what to do. Um, all right. So there's some recommended responses to members of the public. Some of them, I think, are stronger than others, but I think they're still probably the subject of discussion. Oh, so Ideally, mm -hmm. when we get into a really um, difficult conversation, uh, we hire staff. I mean, you guys have a, a capable PIO. You have mm -hmm. a superintendent and his administrative team. I can tell you they consult with legal counsel from time to time about what they can legally disclose versus legally have to disclose or legally withhold. So you've got a good apparatus. You're not working in a district with an unsophisticated apparatus for you to work through. Um, so ideally, we're not going to be having seven different messengers out there putting out their version of events. Instead, uh, there's recommendations in here. Uh, I forwarded this to the superintendent. You can explain how important this issue is to you that you've directed staff to take a look at it. All of these are, are pretty good responses. The other thing about these responses is they won't betray that you've had communications with other board members. When you start going off the script and saying, we've done this, or mm. we're going to do that, or we've decided that, it's not clear to the public that that That's happened great. in closed session. Mm -hmm. Did that happen outside of a meeting? And you open yourself up to scrutiny. You cannot commit a Brown Act violation by making the superintendent do his job. <laughs> Forward it back to him, and you're, you're absolutely in compliance with the law. Um, these are just more explanations. There, there's, some, there's some very good ones out there. Um, do you guys ever, from time to time, uh, prepare for board? Here's, here's a sample response of what, what we're doing so that you can all con speak with common message. That's another effective tool is being proactive on certain things that you know you're going you're gonna to go to church, you're going to go to a PTA meeting, whatever it is, you're going to get asked about something. Staff can prepare a common message so that mm -hmm. everybody knows what staff is doing. Everybody knows it's important to you. You can show them that you're doing your job. Mm -hmm. All right, any questions about any of that? I'm pretty sure I only went to like seven minutes. No, you, you did good. This, okay. this is great. I like yeah, I wish I had all these responses when I was president. <laughs> um, yeah, because the, yeah, these are great. I did have another question and it just went away. So somebody else, yeah. Board self-evaluations. Oh, I know what it was. Closed, open? <coughs> great Evalu question. Evaluation process in general for superintendent, how, is it indeterminate time? Are you evaluating time? yourselves? Mm -hmm. We're doing, we, we conduct well, a, a self-evaluation. So you're not employees. Mm -hmm. so Correct. Right. Well, we are. Okay. We no, are. You're not. We get paid. The it means you cannot oh. go into closed session to talk about yourselves. Yeah. Okay. If you do self evaluations, it would be on your own time. If you do one on ones with administration, it would be an open session. But it would not be a closed session. Either. It could be a special meeting. Mm -hmm. Your own evaluations? Yes. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. 3 a.m. Yeah, what are you concerned about? <laughs> oh, no. We, we, we're we, we're we, concerned, we, we're concerned we, about our. Evaluating yourself. Yeah. You shouldn't. Yeah. Ourselves, we're evaluating the effectiveness we of the board and processing. Most likely done at a workshop. Workshop, yeah. okay. Workshop. Yeah. Okay. Evaluating an employee, including the superintendent or any other employee of the district. There's a specific closed session for um, it's just public employee evaluation. You list the, the name of the position, superintendent. You can go do that in closed session. Um, I would meetings, love a meetings like administrative retreats and advances that the entire board is invited to participate. Well. We don't really, there are, there are things that we are invited to observe, and we sit in the back and we're in the fishbowl, or they're out invited, of the fishbowl. We're out of the fishbowl, but we're, we're observing. Um, it's happening on the so glass. There's, there's special exceptions <laughs> for when board members may attend all kinds of different events and not participate. And they range from conferences, social gatherings, uh, other meetings of other public agencies. We can we can look at each of them um, and say, okay, here's here's the protocol for this particular meeting. But they're but they're not subject to. Are they subject to Brown Act? 
you can answer that question for you. Okay, so, so all right. If, remember, if there's going to be four of you present, I, the, yeah, the that's the key. The rule is that it's subject to the Brown Act. Yeah. You would have to fit it within one of the narrow exceptions to when you're having your meeting. So, so it, there's a lot of exceptions that could apply. We would just want to look at them before. <coughs> So, uh, yeah, and we're, I think one of the things we're talking about is we are, are, are on several committees, and we do. It's usually no more than three, three but we do participate. So um, we don't necessarily make a group decision. Sometimes we do. And um, I'm thinking like foundations, um, cha like chamber of commerce meetings, Community education. Meetings that has to do with that youth council meetings. And so it sounds like it's important that there aren't more than three in the room. Anytime you get a fourth, you have to worry about Okay, that. and it's not our meeting, it's their meeting. So if you have a, a number of meetings that you attend and you wanna give the list to Fred, mm -hmm. it would be easy for us to tell you okay. there's an exception. Okay, there, there give them all of our lists, list. yeah. yeah. For example, when you go to CSBA, all seven of you can sit through a workshop, and it's yes. not subject to the Brown Act. Right. Yeah, that one. That's what about good. superintendent calling meetings, or staff, and we're and there's four of us participating, and it's not necessarily we're here we're receiving information. I'd be concerned that the Brown Act. Yeah. Okay. So as long yeah, as it's three, we topic, never do four. Okay. We never do four. No, I know, I know what she's talking. About. Okay, and then um, our public, rec our public request a subject if we go if we're we're we are appointed to a sometimes we're several of us are on, on committees outside of the district they've asked for an official representative that's what you so that's what Vicky just said well I did but that was three but are they subject also if there's so only we, one of us we, going one oh would be, for example the um, county committee on district organization mm -hmm. yeah one of you guys participated yeah in that. Mm -hmm. so that that meeting is probably Okay. Okay. On their side. On their Got side. It. Uh, another example is common for one or two board members to be on a JPA. Uh, I, I don't know if you guys have ROP for the JPA. Yep. Then mm -hmm. that would be an example that's handled the Brown Act yep. on that side. Yeah. Okay. But um, still only three. I don't know how many attend. No, but still only three of us. Normally it's one or two. Okay. But for for a. For but a no more than three is what I'm yeah. getting at. If you get a fourth, of course, avoid at all cost. You either have to, and we have, have to do all this. We have, have to be notified. Yeah. Or you would have to fit it within one of the exceptions. And okay. And it, I know you guys are very active. There are a number of exceptions. Okay. Um, we just want you to be of heightened awareness when there's four of you in the same room. Yeah. So, so if I think you haven't received this. We haven't received the superintendent's you know, direction. The Brown Act doesn't apply to this. You might want to. Okay. Thank you, Tony. I think if we have any great. further questions, direct them to Fred, and okay. you. you can front, and we can get some. I want to talk directly to Tony. I don't want to talk. To <laughs> <laughs> that's not how it works. But that's <laughs> expensive. <laughs> All right. Well, yeah, I, I can thank, you. thank you. Thank you for your time. Perfect. Thank God you. bless you. Thank you so much. That was yeah. great. And we love your tie. Okay. Oh yeah. Unsolicited. Your whole ensemble. <laughs> yeah. Terrific. Great. Oh, that thank you. Great. You want? Five, oh yes. Let's we'll take five minutes because they have some setup to do. Good. So no, perfect. Not, not bad, but good. And communications and confidentiality and public requests, you know, information. So this is all public too. So we really appreciate. Um, we had one board member who wasn't able to make it at the beginning. So thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you on behalf of the board um, for adjusting your calendars and coming in a little bit later. So um, you know what? In the interest of time, um, we're going to go ahead and start. So, Dr. Uh, Navarro, you want to introduce and start the Absolutely. Well, I'm going to hand it off to Mr. Drake, who is going to uh, lead this or facilitate this session for us. I think you're going to find this extremely informational and valuable. Thank you, Dr. Navarro, and uh, thank you, President Fleur and uh, board members. Um, I, you know, I think uh, it's important to step back uh, in, in light of our weekend. Um, for a minute and, and recognize, I think, the importance of, of what we do um, in, in really supporting a community. Um, obviously, our primary uh, responsibility is, is the safety and learning of kids, but we do so much more than that. Um, and so I just want to put everything in context that we're in this together. 
mm -hmm. um, as a community, you know, supporting each other, obviously through these hard times, but really supporting each other um, uh, together uh, in, in, in relation to um, our kids. Um, and so, you know, in light of that, I want to make sure, um, you know, that, that everybody knows our thoughts and, and uh, prayers are with the families uh, of those that suffered, uh, you know, a, a tragic loss, as we all have. Um, and just recognize, you know, what we do as a community here, because it transcends and translates into our classrooms. Um, and is, is probably more important than anything we do. So I want to start with that because... Um, Really, I want, I'm, I'm grateful for the opportunity to be a community in here today learning together. Um, and in, in that vein, you know, um, although I, I, was, I was planning on saying I'd rather be doing this in a coffee shop so we could get loud and really debate um, as opposed to this formal setting, but I think it would probably be a Brown Act violation of oh, yes. some sort. Um, <laughs> But we are here today really uh, to learn together, um, you know, and, and one of the things I've recognized being in this position now for my fifth year is the more I learn, the more questions I have. Huh? Um, and the more questions I have, the more I learn. Um, and even if uh, I don't have the answer to that question right away, as may be the result of some of our conversation today, we'll go find it um, because that's, that's really what, what learning is. Having said that, um, you know, knowing that we have a significant amount of time, but not an enormous amount of time, um, uh, in, in discussing and planning for this, you know, I'm reflecting on our standards a little bit, and our standards talk about uh, going deeper. Uh, and so we're going to do that today, and, and as much as progress monitoring is, is across our system, our K-12 system, I want to go deep K-3. Um, and uh, in our elementary schools, knowing that we can always come back together um, and, and um, address some of the other grade levels, um, you know, at another time. Um, and we're going to do that both in mathematics and literacy. I'm going to start off with mathematics, um, K-3, and go through some learning and then hand it over to um, Kathleen Leary to get into to literacy. Um, but, but really, thank you for the time. This is going to be a little bit uh, different in the past. I may actually have you do some math um, oh, and talk math. a little bit amongst each other <laughs> and, and do some things like that. So um, I know when I hear that, I used to break out in a cold sweat, but I'm feeling a little bit better about myself mm -hmm. mathematically <laughs> these days. So uh, let's jump in. Um, a, a couple of other ideas really come to mind. You know, we, we do know um, that, that learning is, is primary to everything that we do, um, say, and act upon uh, in our district. That's, that's at the forefront of every, everything we do. And a couple things have struck me about that um, over the last couple of years as I've um, you know, thought about uh, what learning is and looks like. And um, from a student perspective, um, and what we're being charged with in, in relation to our standards, is that students actually understand, um, not just that they're able to perform things, but they actually understand the performance and the, the, the concepts behind what they're performing so that they can apply them in life. Um, and students come with an understanding that we need to, under, that we need to know about um, and deeply understand as teachers in order to then build and construct more knowledge on, on top of what they understand. The other piece that, that relates even more to, to this graphic here is it struck me that, um, you know, kind of in reflecting on my career, um, I spent a year in a teaching credential program um, and, and learned a lot, sort of, right? Mm -hmm. Nothing is, is as much as you learn on the job. Mm -hmm. But then all the rest of my learning for the next 30, 35 years was turned over to a school district. Um, to make sure that I continued to learn and grow and evolve as an educator. Um, and that's a really, really, really large responsibility that we have. Um, and, and so in that, in that vein, this graphic um, displays for you um, our vision or my vision of, of how we support teachers. Because no longer are we supporting teachers in coming and getting something, getting a strategy, um, or a trick to go and perform um, and do because it works. Instead, um, what, we're, what we're doing when we get together um, is, is we're, we're talking and building content knowledge, pedagogical knowledge, all around how students understand and think. Um, and we're, we're doing that deeply. So when we, when we get together to learn, 
we're not showing them how to do something, but we're learning together about these three knowledge bases. And doing that in deep levels gets at um, a couple really important things for us as a school district. Number one, it really gets it and challenges beliefs. Um, you know, beliefs in what kids can do, beliefs in structures and systems that we have or maybe even need to change. So this knowledge challenges some of those beliefs, but in, this, in, in the same sense, doing this as a community of teachers together, as we have set up, starts creating communities of beliefs, right? That can then translate into visions um, because we're practicing all of these things together and in, in the end, you know, build a larger knowledge base and clear vision of what needs to be happening in our classrooms, not because principal or director or assistant superintendent says, but it's, because, but, but it's because we've constructed a vision together around common beliefs. Um, at the same point, the learning becomes something that happens every day for our, our teachers. If they're focusing on interpreting how kids are knowing and understanding the content putting in, being put in front of them, and then teachers are being asked to respond in the moment to do that, and then have opportunities to reflect on that, learning continues throughout the day. Um, and so that is that is kind of the setup that we have in place um, to support the learning of our teachers for the next 35, 40 years, or in my case, you know, maybe 20 more years <laughs> that, that hopefully I'll be here. Having said that, you've all seen this or heard about this uh, over the last two years. Uh, one of the ways we've started approaching, you know, that graphic of, of creating um, learners during their teaching is, is through cognitive guided instruction um, and, and training around cognitive guided instruction. And I wanna be really, really clear. Cognitive guided instruction is not a strategy. Cognitive guided instruction is a way of teaching and thinking that actually is never done. In, in reality, it, right now, it's about a 35 uh, year um, base of research that continues to evolve. What CGI was 35 years ago is very different than what it is today because they continue to learn as um, they're researching how kids think and process, understand, and how that can be then translated into application of their knowledge. Um, and in CGI, the ideas behind CGI is kids are given multiple opportunities to construct and understand mathematics, um, but even the principles that we, that we talk about in CGI can be a, applied across curr uh, a curriculum and content. Mm -hmm. And really what it is, it's, it's providing teachers a space to develop a way of thinking of teaching with students at the center and the student thinking at the center of, of everything that they do and all the decisions they make in relation to, to both monitoring their understanding and making instructional decisions of how to move them forward. We've spent uh, obviously a significant amount of time and effort uh, with these 130 teachers who have participated um, and uh, they've, they've learned an enormous amount um, and continue to learn um, evidence to, uh, that you'll hear about um, in a little bit from Shelly and Christina here to my right who are two third grade teachers um, from Sonora. Some principles that are also guiding our work are, are in front of you. Um, and we, you know, as we go through this and experience both training and experience um, uh, different uh, um, classroom opportunities together or experience different learnings together, um, we start constructing um, more clear ideas around these uh, principles. But first off, um, uh, we wanna make sure that as, as teachers and leaders, um, we're always positioning students as competent sense makers. Um, and what you'll notice there is that, that it, um, it doesn't say it in there, but it, it should, all students as competent sense makers. Um, and and the, the way that that works is that a, a couple of things, we wanna situate kids in the learning and, and in the um, actions that, that say a mathematician would take. Um, as they're doing math. And if you talk to mathematicians, one of the things you hear from them is that they're rarely right, <laughs> right? But when they're wrong, they go back and revise their thinking until they get it right. Um, and, and they do that because they're just making sense of the mathematics. Uh, and we always wanna position all kids as competent regardless of what we label them. They bring something, they bring some knowledge that we need to uh, identify. Uh, understand and then build on in relation to the content that we're putting in front of them. We also want to know students, right? It's really, really important that we know students academically, but as important that we know students as people. 
um, that we know their, their um, cultures, we know their communities, we know their likes, and we, we're presenting them with context because we know that with learning context that they can relate to um, because we know them. Uh, we engage them in rigorous content once again, our standards are rigorous, right? Uh, they're, they're asking kids to do things at earlier ages or at ages that we were doing at later ages, um, but doing it at a level of understanding, not just being able to do, but really understanding and knowing the content. And we wanna make sure that we're putting that in front of them all the time, and not just select front, um, students, but all of them, because they can all bring something to the, to the learning in the classroom. The other thing that, that ends up happening, we've spent a lot of time um, uh, and conversation around um, bias in this district, um, which is really important um, in understanding our own biases and what we bring to, to you know, the table in relation to bias, whether that's explicit or intrinsic or, or any of the, uh, of the such. Same in classrooms. We, you know, we want to challenge teachers to recognize that all kids can do it. Um, and that we sometimes have preconceptions or preconceived ideas of what certain kids are able to do, and that may prevent us from giving them actually access to that rigorous content. And so we constantly wanna be challenging that, and if we do that, I think what we discover is that um, we'll be surprised uh, by what kids are able to do. And then the last two, um, well the first four really come out of um, ideas of ambitious and responsive teaching out of the University of Washington. I've added the last two because I think it's important for us um, in every single classroom that we own the, the students who are in there. Um, and as much as I've taught it, they just haven't learned it, is sometimes part of our thinking, we've gotta get rid of that and recognize that if we actually spend our time understanding what kids are understanding and how they're thinking, right, we can move them forward ourselves in the classroom. And so it's our responsibility to make sure kids have learned and that our teaching reflects that. And then finally, back to that kind of base knowledge of by building our knowledge, we're gonna continue to learn from our teaching so we can never stop learning, it's never done. So I sent you this weekend uh, this article, um, Helping Kindergartens Make Sense of Numbers Up to 100. Um, mm -hmm. Hope some of you had some time to get through it. I know it was, it was, a, it was a Sunday when I sent it. Um, but I wanna give you a, a minute to go ahead and read this quote and then we'll have, have some conversation about it. What I'd like you to do is turn to an elbow partner or two um, and have uh, a discussion for a minute or two about what jumps out to you, what, what, um, what really jumps out to you in this quote. <laughs> for me, what jumps out to an elbow partner right now? Well, turn off the mic. <laughs> I'm gonna ask you to finish up your thoughts. So it's important that we, we take the time uh, when learning together to, to make sense, you know, of, of what it is that's being put in front of us. So um, that was the opportunity uh, before we open it up to the you know, to the public, so to speak, for you to make some sense. So I'm just curious, what, what jumps out at you with this quote? For me, allowing children to solve problems in ways that make sense to them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when you allow them to do that, then it gives the teacher an opportunity to see Mike. what they're doing 
and then they can go back and process how they can teach it. Microphone. Right. Microphone. Oh, oh. sorry. He's our microphone monitor. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. Yeah, so I, th I think that that really gets at progress monitoring, yeah. right? One of those pieces. I, I like that. It isn't just the mathematical goal, but it's the children's thinking that guides the instructional process. Because back in the day, it was we do page one, and then tomorrow we do page two, because by the end of the year, we have to be at the end of the book. And now it's we went like this. And that didn't go where I thought it was going to go. So the teacher went in a different direction to help the kids to get to the goal instead of just saying, you didn't get it? Oh, well, we're moving on. That, that's huge. I, yeah. And if I, I can just interject yeah. real quickly there, I, I'm, 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 I highlighted it, so maybe I cheated a little bit. But I think it's really important just to clarify sometimes that misconception of our new standards or our new math. Um, it's not just a free-for-all. It's no. not just the kids do it how you want and it's all going to work out. There really is intentional goals that we know we have to get kids to. Um, but it is, Shar, that idea of, pro of monitoring that thinking and understanding of students specific to that goal that's going to get us there. Mm -hmm. So I want to be really clear about that. This isn't just a no. free for all. Back in the day of kindergarten spelling where you couldn't read it. Correct. Because they wrote whatever they wanted. Yeah. I think uh, one of the things that I take uh, away from this, but also with my, my grandkids, because I have a kindergartner and a third grader, um, a second grader who's actually doing the third grade curriculum, and their comments are, it's exhausting. Mm -hmm. And I think we, ha we have to really, you know, as, they're, as we're pushing them to think th through their own way of how they, how they learn and what's best for them, is that we have to be cognizant of all that, you know, Back in the day, it was like, you know, you mind your mom, you mind your dad, you follow the rules, and you do everything. And now they're, they're, you're, you're asking them to think, think <laughs> and, and really come up with their own way of how do you solve this and then explain it. And that can be exhausting. <laughs> it, it really can be um, initially. And, and yeah. I think one of, the, one of the opportunities, hopefully, only in threesomes, not in foursomes or fives, and we don't have Brown Act violations, but. Um, <laughs> is to visit some classrooms where, where this has been going on for a bit of time, and you're actually gonna find a, a higher energy level from my perspective. Exactly. Um, once kids recognize they own, yeah. right, they have the agency in the classroom. Um, but, but you're right, it, is, it, it takes some time to get there, and I think that, that these two will attest to that. So this jumped out to me when I read it the first time too, was um, by posing carefully selected problems. What does that mean? Would you like to address that or not? So I, I can tell you what it means to me. So yeah. there's a couple of things, and we go back to some of the principles of knowing students. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things we want to do is make sure that the problems we're posing to them are, are a context that they understand mm -hmm. um, that, so that they can not only bring some of the formal mathematical knowledge, um, but they can also bring some of that informal knowledge that they have from just living to the problem to solve it and make sense of it. So there's that part. There's also that part of progress monitoring and knowing that, let's just say, and I'll, I'll show an example here, but we have a student who's got the word, pro an addition word problem that they're, you know, it's 81 plus 56, and they're drawing every single one of the cookies and then mm -hmm. counting them. N not really uh, where we want kids, it's a, it's, they're, they're bringing some knowledge to the table. Mm -hmm. We would probably want to think about the next problem we want to give that child in order to move them to that next level of understanding of maybe place value and using place value to solve problems. So being really intentional both with numbers that we're using, the context that we're thinking about in, in relation to posing problems, as well as what the learning, the next step in their learning trajectory would be. So problems, that's really great. Problems address their specific learning goals for that student. That's really, yeah, that's great. Yeah, and, and granted, right, we've got a classroom of 30, right? Mm -hmm. So there's, and, and again, uh, Shelly and Christina will talk about the process that they go through to monitor and make decisions. Um, you'll, you'll know specific to that student, but you're also going to have to probably generalize for the class. This is about where my class is for this problem. And then it's about also thinking about who you want working with whom to move mm -hmm. them along. Okay, thank you. So some core practices also of responsive teaching. Again, I'm not gonna go through all of these, but our focus today are milestones and progress monitoring. 
So eliciting and responding to student thinking, I think we've kind of uh, beat that one up a bit at this point uh, to recognize how critical it is for us to really elicit that in order for us to move kids along. And we do that through monitoring their thinking and understanding around specific goals. Um, and then we talked about having a specific goal in mind as a teacher based off of the rigorous content that we know we have to create an understanding for for kids or that kids have to create an understanding from. And then assessing that, that understanding regularly and constantly both in the moment of teaching, after teaching in order to set up our, our next steps. The other practices will come out, I think, as you hear some of the other conversation that, that uh, Shelly and Christine will bring out in their, um, um, in their uh, delivery of how they progress monitor kids. But also for our conversation, I thought I would, I would put progress monitoring and what it means to, to, to us now. Um, you know, oftentimes I think, um, and, and guilty oftentimes as well, in thinking that progress monitoring is the end of unit assessment or is SBAC. Um, while important, you know, while important uh, pieces of monitoring how kids are doing, um, we're really talking about knowing in the moment how students are thinking, all students are thinking about the content we're putting in front of them. Um, and we're monitoring that on a daily and actually probably a, a minute by minute um, uh, 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 way in the classroom. Um, and we wanna talk and show how that, how that looks. Um, and it also is just part of the work of teaching. And I'll be honest that this is a bit of a struggle in, in, in talking with um, Shelly and Christina. The collaboration that needs to take place, we need to look at some of our systems of how we're supporting teachers with the time we already have so that this work can be done within the working of teaching. Now, Shelly and Christina are doing that, right? Um, on a regular basis, but they also do a lot after school and, and um, you know, we, we have lots of support for them or try to provide them the support to the level we can. Um, and that support sometimes comes in, in the way of a text message at 10 o'clock at night, <laughs> back and forth, and oftentimes it's instigated by them. Um, but, but that is something that we're working on is, is making this part of just our teaching and our practice. Um, and then knowing what students know and understand every day in detail so that we can make some really strong instructional decisions for that next day as opposed to just turning a page is, is uh, related to our, our monitoring of progress. Um, and also in real time. So as opposed to some of the big data we look at, SBAC, which we can reflect on what happened, we wanna be monitoring in the moment of teaching so that we can ask that next question in the moment that's gonna move several kids uh, along in their learning. And it also allows, or if we do it in this way, it allows for that decision making both short term and long term that we know is critical um, to creating environments and communities of learners. John, so yes. in terms of those two, the, the knowing every day in detail and shaping the teaching in real time and understanding how on the continuum of, of responsiveness um, from the district's point of view to the teachers and the kids in the classroom are we pretty responsive in being able to provide them that information or or is it incumbent upon them to get the information and do we have those systems in place to get that information to them? That are we meeting that need or are we still building that, that capacity and that continuum? So what I would like to do is hold on to that question okay. because as Shelly and Christina kind of go through um, how they progress model, I think you're gonna see it. Um, it's really something, when we talk about going back to that initial graphic of building content knowledge and pedagogical knowledge and knowledge around student thinking, those are the tools that we need to build in teachers so that they can do this in the moment, right? As well as if, if and we'll talk about some of the, you know, four to six week dipstick assessments we wanna do, how they can also analyze um, that to get the information they need to make some instructional decisions, okay? So the big goal being that this is actually in the work of teaching at sites. Um, and some of the bigger data, sure, we can provide that for them, but in the moment, timely information really needs to come from them in working and understanding well, how kids it, are making. It would be different between, between schools, between classrooms, between teachers. All kids are gonna be, yeah, knowing and expressing their understanding in different ways and, and, and getting teachers into that place of being able to analyze that and make decisions based off of all the knowledge they have is where we wanna get. 
So big ideas and milestones. Um, uh, again, I wanna, I, I wanna reiterate um, kind of a shift, at least in my thinking in relation to milestones that, that frames, I think, the progress monitoring that we'll share with you. Um, I've been thinking in the past of prog or milestones as grade levels. Third grade seems to be a milestone grade level. Sixth grade seems to be a milestone grade level. Eighth grade, 11th grade, 12th grade, those are milestone grade levels. Uh, for our conversation as I was preparing for this, what I actually realized is that the story of, of content or the story of mathematics in this case really has milestone understandings at each grade level. Um, that we need to make sure are, are, are strongly in place for kids and understanding uh, in these milestone uh, areas before they leave that grade level in order to then continue to progress and, and make sense of the story of, of math. So when we're thinking about kindergarten, um, you see, it, you know, it seems very easy, right? It's counting, it's cardinality, and we'll talk about those, and it's adding and subtracting. Okay, but those are actually really complex um, ideas for kids. So when we're talking about counting, we're talking about that one, them understanding that one-to-one -one correspondent, that if I've got a group of beans, and I'm gonna touch one bean, that's one, the next one is two, the next one is three, and I understand that those symbols actually represent that amount or that quantity. That's one-to-one -one correspondence. That has to be firmly in place for kids. Sounds simple, but it's not because that's a really abstract idea for kids coming into school. The other piece is as they count, and they count higher and higher, right, up to let's just say 100, they recognize whatever number they end with represents that quantity, right? So if I'm counting and I end at 81, I recognize that all those things I just counted um, together equal 81, okay, or 81. That's cardinality. Right, that idea of recognizing one to one and that as a group, um, they, they equal an amount. As far as addition and subtraction goes, um, in, in kindergarten, um, it's, it's really important that they understand the concept of addition and subtraction being putting together and taking apart. Right, that, that, that is an understanding. Not that they can necessarily, I mean, it's, it's still gonna be important that they can show us they can do it, but really we're after the understanding of putting together and taking apart. Um, because that gets at decomposing and composing of numbers, which becomes really critical as we get into larger numbers later on. So an example would be if we take the number 10, right, which is a, a really critical number in a base 10 um, <laughs> system, right, for kids to understand how to put together and take apart the numbers within 10. So they've got that natural tool, right? And so if we, if we say, you know what, um, how many more, if, if we've got, you know, that many, sorry, it's kind of hard to do, how many more do you need to get to 10? One, two, three, so what does that mean? Well, that means seven and three gets me to 10, right? So that idea of putting together and also taking apart, you can do the same thing, right? If I take away the seven, what do I have? I've, I've taken away seven, so now I've got three. So understanding that you can pull up, uh, put together and take numbers apart is really important for kids. Um, in kindergarten, and then we go on to first grade and second grade, and you'll see place value, addition, and subtraction. Seems, again, really, really simple, right? That's all we gotta do, and then? Well, the reality is, when we're talking about first grade, kids need to be able to add up to 100, numbers up to 100, and they need to, in, in second grade, up to 1,000, mm. which is why place value comes in, right? Kids need to understand that uh, 10 ones equals a group of 10, Right, and when we talk about those decade numbers, right, that first number in the decade number, the, the 90, that first number represents how many tens are in that number. Um, so that they can then pull numbers apart in, in, in order to add them or subtract them fluently within 100, right, without having to draw 99 cookies if we're talking about cookies, right? They can just do the numbers and pull them apart. So place value becomes critical and so does orders of operations in first and second grade. So those have to be solidly in place for them to transition in to third grade where it becomes multiplication, right? Which has a lot of addition and subtraction um, involved in it and division. And then also the understanding that fractions and fractions are actually numbers. If we have those, those first three um, grade, for, for kinder first and second uh, understandings and milestone understandings solidly in place, fractions just become another number, right? It doesn't become this 
you know, abstract thing that I don't really, I can't really make sense of. So place value, addition and subtraction, counting, K2, and then we jump into the division, multiplication, and fractions in third grade. So Mar Martha, hopefully this will address a little bit of your questions. Yeah. So um, believe it or not, this is an experience that I had about a week ago. Um, I, I called a College Park second grade teacher and asked if I could come teach a lesson, and this is the problem ah, I took in. How fun. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, number one, uh, I've, I've, uh, Michelle, kind of to your question, when we, when, when we look at the problem presented, a couple of things happened. Um, number one, I knew going in I didn't know the kids. I mean, I, I'm going in, this is the first time I'm going to meet them, so I've got to think about context. I'm figuring second graders probably like cookies, mm -hmm. right? And I'm pretty sure they like parties and getting ready for parties. Um, and so I'm <laughs> going to create a problem around that, right? That's going to give kids who, even if they don't necessarily feel confident with those numbers, have access mm -hmm. to start trying something, right? Because they can bring some informal knowledge to it. Um, the other thing interesting about this, and I'll get back to this towards the end of this story, but are the numbers that we did put in here. Um, 56 and 81, and this is a second grade class. Um, and I talked to the teacher ahead of time and I gave her you know, a, a choice of four different number sets and she said, let's try 56 and 81. The other three number sets were below 100. Mm -hmm. What I didn't know, but um, found out later, is this was gonna be the first time that these kids went beyond 100 uh -huh. in their adding. It's probably good I didn't know that, right? Because <laughs> back to that challenging some of the inequities, I'm wondering what preconceived ideas I would have had or limited kids had I gone in knowing that. Um, anyhow, um, we uh, went through and made sense of the story problem together at the beginning and then turned them loose. And these are two student responses. Oh, they're two different students. Two different students. You have the one on the left and the one on the right. Um, and a, an old tendency of mine or ours would have been to look at the answer, okay? They both got it. They both got 137. But if I don't take the time to then dig in, and this is where progress monitoring comes in, to understand what they understand in second grade, remember place value, adding and subtracting, putting together and taking apart are critical understandings. I can look at the student on the right and recognize he or she, and I think it was a she, um, understands an enormous amount, right? First of all, they're able to compose and decompose the 56 and the 81, pulling the 50 apart and the six, the tens and the ones, the 80 and the one. And then the other thing there that they demonstrate is definitely place value because how do they combine them? They combine the tens, right? The 50 and the 80 to make 130, and then they combine the ones, um, the six and the one, to then put them together, right? And then they get their answer. So if I had only looked at the answer, I wouldn't really know and understand what this student understands. We really have to take the time to monitor their thinking um, in their work. The other thing to just kind of recognize that although it's way down the line for them, they're combining like terms, um, which becomes algebraic later on. Right, and so the, the utility of everything that we can see when we actually analyze work is incredible. Then we take the student on the left, okay? So this is what we call direct modeling, right? They're, they're drawing every single cookie in, in this problem, right? We've got a set of 51 and a set, of, or a set of 56 and a set of 81. Um, there isn't any indication that they're thinking about tens, like they're not grouping them in tens or anything like that. Um, they direct modeled and counted which is great, right? They're bringing some knowledge, right, to it. But if all I'm looking for is the answer, I don't know what I need to do next for that kid because I think that they got it, right? So there's some really intentional things that we can do in monitoring this way to set that student up to start transitioning into recognizing how important it is um, to understand place value, how important base 10 is in a problem like this, and how that lends itself to us really understanding the mathematics we're doing as opposed to just doing it. Um, so this is just that example, uh, Martha, kind of back. There isn't anything that I can put together in my office to provide for teachers right. in order to teach and monitor in this way, which is why we're focused on building that knowledge of content pedagogy and student thinking. Um, to kind of end this story and trans, you know, pass it off here, um, I, I mentioned earlier that this was the first time this class had been beyond 100 in their adding. Um, and the teacher told me this afterwards, but what struck me before I even knew that was 
once we made sense of the problem, and I did, I made sense of the problem uh, without putting the numbers in. I put the numbers in last. And first of all, once I put the numbers in, there was kind of this <gasps> big numbers, right? And then we said go, and every single kid in that class got to work. There wasn't a single student in there who didn't, uh, you know, who sat there thinking, I don't, I don't know what to do, right? That to me speaks to a really important aspect of all of this, which is building a culture in a classroom um, where kids, number one, recognize I'm in charge of my learning, right? And I can do this, um, which is exactly kind of a, a handoff to Shelly and Christina because, um, and I'm gonna throw this out there as another opportunity sometime in the future that um, small groups of us go and visit these classrooms um, to really see uh, what they're talking about when they're talking about learning norms and, and the environment they've created in their classrooms. So I'll give you just a moment to read through the learning norms, either on your handout or this lovely poster back here. It's a little fancier than ours in our classroom. <laughs> yeah. So these are things that take time for us to establish these norms at the beginning of the school year. We spend a few weeks uh, introducing a few each day until we've introduced them all, but we constantly refer back to them. So the students are very familiar with them. They're able to um, identify which norms are being used at times when I say, oh, a student just used one of our norms, which one is it? And they'll look at the poster and they'll figure out which norm that they had just used. Um, these are norms that we use throughout the entire day through our language arts time, our math time, and we tell them that these are things that can carry over into daily living too, uh, that they can use as adults. <coughs> and uh, we refer to them throughout the lesson. Sometimes we preface a lesson by introducing or pointing out a few of the norms that we want them to really focus on during the lesson. So there's something that we're constantly referring to. If you take a look at number three, one of their favorites is remember that it's okay to make mistakes and it's okay to revise your thinking. And so they get really excited because they like to be right. So when they have to listen to each other, so if you look at um, number five, they're really asked to listen to the conversations that they're having with each other and try to make sense of what that student is saying to see if they can understand it. And then sometimes their friend is able to change their mind on an answer because they really did actually take it to heart and listen um, to how their friend explained it. And then they get really excited and say, I revised my thinking. And it's a daily basis, on a daily basis, we have students saying that. And it just, um, it helps give them that sense of accomplishment and the ability that it's okay to make those mistakes and to revise your thinking. Again, things that we do in everyday life. I like that it's, your norms have rigorous vocabulary and <laughs> they don't even realize they're learning at a higher level, sub, subterfuge, good job. That's true. Okay, in a moment we're about to watch a student solve this problem, but before we do that, we wanted to give you the opportunity to solve it yourself in just a moment. So it's on the, in the packet on the yellow paper it's that coming. you have. I think it's coming Everybody down the line right getting, now. Okay. So uh, before you start, as Christina mentioned, we will often refer to our norms as we introduce a problem, such as this problem has um, a multi-digit, it's a multi-digit multiplication problem, which they might not have seen before. So we might say, well, let's remember our classroom norm number two, that we're gonna keep trying even when learning is challenging. They're used to that, so they do have that attitude of, okay, I'm, I'm not afraid to attack this. And then also that we would, before just handing them the problem and say, here, read it and do it, we spend some time, like John said, unpacking the problem, taking out the numbers often and saying, okay, what's the situation here? What do, who's in the problem? What do we have? What, what is this story about? And um, as we talked about earlier too, we, we often write the problems ourselves based on what's going on in the classroom, what's going on in life, who's around, we put their names in it, that kind of a thing. So they have that comfort and familiarity. So we'd like you to just go ahead and take a moment to solve the problem in any way that you wish. Any way you wish. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna draw crayons. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> I got it right here. This is what she's doing. <laughs> You got 24 in there? Yes. Each one, it, each one of those? Yes. That's well, yes. I'm, I'm, yeah. Da, 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 da. That's the way I did it. That's, yeah. yeah. That's how I was taught. Or I could do it this way. This is another way I do it. Or you could pull it. Some stimulus for the rest of our cookies, <laughs> our crayons. The cookies would be a nice addition, right? <laughs> <laughs> I saw it three ways. I did, yeah. Is there so, a norm for that? <laughs> So something that we frequently ask our students to do is to share their work with each other, to share it with the whole class, and we're very strategic in how we go about doing that. But we thought we'd give you guys a moment to just share with your elbow partner how you solved it. This is how I learned it. I did. Cool. That's it. No, I like. Yeah. Okay. Groups, multiple groups. How quick are the first? So we assume that, as adults, most of us would probably refer to the standard algorithm that we learned in school. And so actually, this is a fifth grade standard for students to be able to solve it using the standard algorithm. But in a third grade classroom, um, we wouldn't teach the standard algorithm here. However, there are a lot of ideas and um, conceptual understandings that the students need to have to build up for being ready to solve it uh, fluently multiple multi-digit whole numbers using the standard algorithm. Uh, there was a study shown with some kindergartners who had uh, solved a lot of difficult problems that you might not associate with being a kindergarten level, and they were very successful in solving them. The percentage was really high in the number of kindergartners that could solve these problems. They gave the same set of problems to first graders, and the percent that got them correct decreased a little bit, <coughs> and it continued to decrease each year through fifth grade, where the percentage of students that could solve the same ones in kindergarten went from like the low 90% of kindergartners solving them to a much lower percentage of fifth graders being able to solve the exact same problems. So if you think about why that might be, um, part of it is understanding the problem as a story, but it's also they have been taught a lot of procedures, and mm. they're they're going based off of a procedure instead of having that conceptual understanding first. We learned about that research study in CGI and, and it, it really was interesting to think about that, that the, the kindergartners are thinking about it as a story, yeah. as a real life situation. And as students start to learn those procedures, and we've seen it in our classrooms, they'll, they'll be presented with the story problem and they'll just grab the numbers and start doing something with them before they've really understood what is the story going on there. Um, so th we just were fascinated by that. That was one of the first things that we learned in, in CGI. I think that also kind of spent, uh, lends itself to the idea of, of application, that we want kids to be able to, when they leave us, um, be able to make sense of problems. Right, because we all have them throughout life and throughout our adult life, and we want to also build that that utility of confidence to be able to solve problems, right, as opposed to just being told how to do it. So we're about to watch one of my students, Michelle. She's a delightful child, full of personality, solving the problem that you just solved. Um, and what we'd like you to notice is, first of all, her her confidence, her enthusiasm. We see that a lot in the way that we have changed our, our math, mathematics instruction in that the, the students feel more confident and more competent about attacking a, a somewhat difficult problem or something that might be a little bit new to them. So I want you to notice that and also to notice that what, what is she actually doing and what does she actually understand? After we watch her solve the problem, we'll take a look at her work and talk about what, what she knows. 
One other thing that's interesting that I just noticed is um, to, you see to the right here um, are some blocks, base 10 blocks, the need to use tools um, for mathematics. Well, Michelle, I'll kind of ruin it a little bit, but doesn't necessarily use the tools. They're there and available to her if she needs them. All right, here we go. You can read this one. Read the problem about the <laughs> The teacher has five boxes of crayons, box has 24 crayons. How many crayons does the teacher have in all? He's using a pen. pen. What's your answer? 120. Okay. So I think I saw mostly what you did there. Um, how did you, so I see you had like the form four is eight and the form four is eight there. Can you, can you show me where that is on your paper? The four and the four is right here. Yeah. So then how did you figure out how much all that was? I know that you had a hundred from over on that other side, but how did you get to that 20? What'd you do? I just thought 20 and 20 equals 40 uh -huh. because 2 plus 3 equals 4, so mm -hmm. in the in the tens it would equal 4. Okay. So 20 plus 20 equals 40, and then 20 plus 20 equals 40, so yeah. that would equal 80. And if I added the extra 20, that would be a 60. So when I added, when I added, uh, so 40, the 40 plus, 60 plus 40 equaled uh, 100. Yeah. And since I had the 4s, I just add 4 plus 4 equals 8. And 4 plus 4 equals 8, so that would be equals 16. And the 4, 16 plus, 16 plus 4 equals 20. Got it. Got it. Nice job. <laughs> So taking a look at Michelle's work here, in thinking about what, are, what understandings are evident in the work that she's showing. So just take a minute to think about that and then I'll kind of go through the things that we noticed from her work. So one of the things that we can see from her work, and these are questions that we would actually ask her to explain or her to explain to a partner or to the class, where, where are the five boxes in the story? So we would bring out the fact that the five 24s are the five boxes. We don't see the number five, we see that there are five 24s. And then what do the 24s represent? They represent the crayons within each box. So really breaking down how her work relates to the story of the problem. And then she also understands the relationship of addition and multiplication. She chose to use repeated addition, probably because she wasn't comfortable with what to do with 24 times five. Knowing her, I think she might know that that is 24 times five, but she chose to solve it in a way that's comfortable to her at this point, because she hasn't been taught that multi-digit algorithm yet. Um, also that she has flexibility with numbers and understanding place value and is able to decompose the 24 into 20 and four and then recompose all that back together. And then she's also able to communicate her thinking on the paper 
as well as verbally. And that's something that we have established as a culture in our classrooms too, because we do so much discussion and sharing of student work and thinking that they know that we, aren't, we don't have the time to sit one-on-one -on -one with a student, every student for every problem like that. So they know that what's on their paper needs to sh clearly display what their thinking was so that when I always tell them when I go <coughs> home at night and I'm sitting on the couch in my pajamas and I look at your work, I wanna be able to know what you were thinking, so try to show me. So she was able to show that really well and, and talk about it really well. They have a lot of comfort with that because it's just what they're used to. Um, and also that it really shows that if, like John was talking about before, if we just looked at that she got 120 and she got it correct, we wouldn't know exactly where she is on that continuum of building towards that fifth grade standard of solving it with the algorithm. For, so for, I'm not from an educational background. What is the standard algorithm? Oh, sorry. That's the standard algorithm would be like if you took 24 and put five below the four okay. and did four times five and put the zero and carry the. My kids way, talk about it. They're like, what's the standard algorithm? I'm sorry. Like, I'm like, um, I know all kinds of algorithms, but right. I don't know what the standard algorithm is. <laughs> when really we say standard really algorithm, really we really think. Really 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 so I didn't solve it that way. Yeah. yeah. We think about standard algorithm as the way, the general way that we were all kind of taught, like with carrying, borrowing, that, that kind of thing. <laughs> sorry. Oh, that's fine. Thank you. So if you look at, back to the standard that is expected to be mastered in fifth grade, you can look at all of the highlighted parts and those are all conceptual understandings that lead up to the fifth grade standard uh, that Michelle demonstrated in solving her problem. So all of those are third grade standards except for the last one is actually a fourth grade standard. But again, these are all conceptual understandings that help to build prior to learning the standard algorithm in fifth grade. I just wanted to jump in for a second about that. So about the standard algorithm, sometimes we see students have been, someone has, has shown them, a parent, a sibling, has shown them that standard algorithm before they've really built these conceptual understandings and that kind of does them a disservice because they're following a procedure that they don't really understand and then they make a lot of mistakes with it. So um, a lot of times we'll have that discussion with parents about why, do we, why are we not teaching them the standard algorithm yet and this is why. We had those same conversations with those same parents <laughs> about three years ago. So you know what I'm talking about. Okay. <laughs> So this kind of leads into just a discussion about the daily work of teaching. So looking at a problem like this, a student solving it, um, Christina and I talk constantly about what our students are doing. So we look at, well, what kind of a problem would we want to pose next for Michelle? Or what would we ask next from Michelle? Or what can, how can we use what Michelle is doing and what she has explained to demonstrate to other students a strategy that's a little bit beyond what they're doing right now. For example, a student that might be direct modeling. I mean, we would, in reality, given this problem to our whole classes, we would have one or two maybe that would want to draw the 24 boxes of crayons. And so pairing Michelle up with that student, having Michelle share her strategy can kind of help go, oh, that's a different way, I, I, I can try it that way. So we make a lot of decisions like that based on this analysis of what our students are doing. Um, another next step that we might ask for Michelle in this case is, is there another equation that you could write that represents this problem? And she might be able to say, well, it's also 24 times five. So just kind of pushing from where they are a little bit, a little bit further. So here is an example. Uh, you have it in front of you on blue paper. And it's an example of some of the monitoring that we are collect, uh, how we monitor our students, how we're collecting the data. So um, this was one that we just did this past week where we had given them some problems to kind of see. So again, that progress monitoring is more of a daily thing. And this was just a little checkpoint that we wanted to see what are they learning so far in fractions? What are their understandings? And so we put this together and we were able to notice that a pattern for both of our classes was where it says labeled one eighth, 
we had a lot of students. Um, I know it doesn't show the full thing on the slide, but on the paper in front of you, you'll notice we notated that several students were counting, or it just said counted. Mm -hmm. So this was a picture of a rectangle partitioned into eight equal sections. And the students were asked to tell us what one of those equal partition sections is, how much it is. And so we were looking for one eighth, but we had several students who had written one eighth, two eighths, three eighths. So we had a discussion of how can we get them to understand that in this area model, that really what we're looking for is one eighth, whereas in a word problem maybe where they're um, counting on. So kind of showing them the difference. So we were able to um, think through some next steps for our class and we'll be developing um, some word problems where they're actually analyzing some student work that show both of those and we'll be able to hopefully push them past with that. Um, yesterday as I was teaching math, it kind of naturally came up to be able to address that a little bit. So my hope is that because I was able to do that, then when we do our next step problem with them that I'll even see more students getting that. Um, it was just something that was able to, it's that responsive teaching of just being able to see it minute to minute sometimes and recognize that, oh, some students are close and they're kind of leading to what I'm hoping that they get. So I was able to pause from what we were doing and kind of segue into going back to this chart that I had looked at with Shelly and we noticed that problem. It's helpful um, organizing our student data like this as opposed to they got it, they didn't get it the correct answer, because it helps us see a trend, like, oh, I have five or six students and you have five or six students that have this particular misconception. Let's plan how tomorrow we can address that misconception. So those are the kind of just day-to-day -day things that we do, or we'll take their stack of problems that they turned in and start sorting them. Okay, these ones solved it this way, these ones solved it this way, and then that helps us pair up kids for tomorrow, that, that kind of a thing. Can I ask a so when do you do this? When do you, uh, do you do it at emails, you do it at night, you do it after school? Between the two of us, it's while we eat lunch, it's okay. texting each other after school, that kind of a thing. Because what's really, uh, what, what's standing out in my mind is this new way of teaching in order to be effective. You have to have additional time, yes. do much more planning involved than when you were just teaching from the book. Turn the page, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, it's I mean, true. Yeah. We've had those conversations with yeah. Don about how it, it, it it's does imperative. take the time and you have, to, you have to have the motivation to, to spend that time and, and some, some have more and some have less and some have of less. extra time, yeah. And it's probably why you're up here today because you're really good at your results. Well, we feel really really grateful that we've had the opportunity to work so closely with yeah. with John coming into our classrooms and learning alongside us and and, and having um, some of the specialists that come in the TOSAs and and work with us and with our kids and that's how we've grown mm -hmm. so much in mm -hmm. our math instruction over the past few years because we've gotten that investment and we realize that we're lucky for that not all teachers there's not time to do that mm -hmm. with every teacher. It sounds like you also share your kids. I mean, you each of you have you have a, a classroom, but if you have five and you have five, you sort of pair together and say, well, we'll do this together at the same time, or do you actually split the kids up and, and, and group them in terms of, of how you're how you're working with the kids? We have done that from time to time. Generally, we're, we're just in our own classrooms with our own students, but we are right next door to each other. And so we we run back and forth. You know, we 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 co we're lucky that we we work well together and that we collaborate well and that we're located right next to each other. And currently, we write right now we have student teachers, both of us. So there's kind of four of us in the mix of talking about all of this. So that's helpful too. The, the, I'm thinking you you use the term group, and that's it's interesting to me in relation to I think, and I'm going to put words in their mouth, but um, in, in relation to how Shelley and Christina think of that, that may be a little bit different of, mm -hmm. and I'm I'm maybe making some conjectures of what you mean by group. Their grouping has to do with um, what their kids are showing them that they understand. And then who, because of their understanding and the trajectory of their, of their learning, who they need to put them with the next day, possibly, in order to move them forward. 
Um, it's not a group of these kids got it, these kids didn't. Right, exactly. They all, I mean, and, and talk about an asset-focused lens um, of, of progress monitoring. That's what we're talking about here. What is it that kids are bringing in, knowing and understanding that we can build on? Um, and making some, some really intentional decisions um, based off of that. They're also teaching each other a lot. So we are more uh, facilitators. We're mm -hmm. facilitating the discussion. We're asking them a lot of questions. And so when you have some students who uh, maybe aren't quite getting something, we're looking to see, well, what do they understand? And now how can we partner them up with right. somebody else? Or um, we're, we want them to be that competent sense maker. So we're looking to see how can we get them there by maybe a different student, not necessarily us showing them, but them listening. Constantly revising your thinking. Yes. <laughs> yes. It's, it's interesting if, if we get an opportunity um, to visit their classrooms, I can 99.9% .9 guarantee you, you will hear several kids say, oh, I'm gonna revise my thinking now in their classrooms. It's, it's, it's pretty fantastic. It's happened every single time I've been in there. Somebody says that. So just a, a, a quick couple of pictures that this is help, uh, helping, happening elsewhere as well. Um, two pictures uh, that kind of depict that. The one on the left is a teacher who every day um, in her lessons is discussing with kids, analyzing work and making note of, of what it is that the kids are understanding in relation to her um, instructional goal for the day. Um, in order to make decisions the next day. And then the, the, the one on the right is a teacher who's in the moment, right, of, has, has documented some understandings of kids and is analyzing that understanding in order to, to decide in the moment what to bring, what understanding to bring in the room to move everybody else um, along. So it, it is happening and it's a different way to look at progress monitoring. So moving on to some of the, the, uh, the bigger piece, I thought it was important to talk about who needs what. Um, and while teachers need both types of progress monitoring, we're going to kind of move now into the idea of some of that bigger summative um, uh, ideas of, of monitoring. Um, but we recognize that we just went through teachers on a daily basis need to be progress monitoring their kids in order to make some, some really intentional decisions for them. Um, but it is also important, like it is important to go to the doctor every six months or year to just get that checkup on how things are going, is, is to do the same, um, you, you know, every four to six weeks with all of the, the content and goals that we've been working on with kids. Um, and uh, I, I'll, I'll be frank and honest with you that, that part of what happens um, about day two of CGI training is teachers start questioning um, whether or not uh, assessments, curricular assessments are actually assessing the mathematics or whether or not they're assessing how the curriculum or materials want the mathematics to be learned and understood. Um, and that's created a little bit of, of, of friction, right? Um, and one of the other questions our CGI groups ask is, you know, is there something more that we could be getting out of our assessments in relation to then making some instructional decisions of what we're gonna do next? So those are some questions we've been grappling with and, and really, um, and although I'm gonna take you in a second from a big view of SBAC down to this idea of, of um, a, a four to six week dipstick assessment, um, we did uh, get a, a group of teachers together this summer to really look at K through third grade um, bridges assessments and have this conversation and make some decisions and actually even make some revisions that we wanted to try um, in, in small class or you know small sets of classrooms, not across the board, right? Um, because we know how much knowledge we need to build in order to actually use these effectively and we're not sure they're gonna work. Right, um, and so we don't wanna just make some split decisions. So we're studying this, but we have done that and we're gonna talk a little bit about that. But in this idea, right, we, we oftentimes, uh, and I made the mistake as a principal of thinking way in the past that this was how I was gonna progress monitor and it's too late at this point, right? It's, it's too late. This gives us an opportunity as, as teachers to look and reflect on the previous year but not necessarily to make any instructional decisions for those kids who are in front of me now. Really important information and data in relation to you know, our systems and our practice as a whole, but not quite as instantly actionable as, as the type of information our teachers are starting to ask for. Um, and then we go to the, the bridges dashboards. Better, right? We're getting, we're getting down, right? So we're getting some big ideas of you know, how many kids are, are understanding some things. Um, but again, the question was, what do they understand? Were these just focused on the answer? Um, and so 
when we break it down even more, and, and you know how these dashboards work, these are, these are just snapshots of them, but we can click on um, that, that green 22% uh, who are getting fours and get a list of the students who, who did well there. But again, our teachers who were looking at this were saying, I still, uh, this is really important and good information, but I don't know what student A actually understands in relation to that standard. And so that's where we decided, you know, okay, well maybe we ought to really look um, and see and, and, and see if there's a, a better way for us to do this. Um, and so I'm gonna turn it back over to Shelly and Christina to talk about um, uh, the, the revisions um, that they've made to some assessments um, and what it's affording them in relation to actually progress monitoring in a way that's actionable for them. So here is just an example of Version one would be the bridges assessment question and version two would be the revised question. In version one, it's asking students to circle different facts in different colors based on whether it's an add 10 fact, a doubles fact, a doubles plus or minus one fact, et cetera. So just take a look at eight plus nine, for example, and think about if you were doing that problem, what color would you circle eight plus nine? <laughs> So you might think, no. you might think it's maybe it's a make 10 fact because you could take one <laughs> from the eight and give it to the nine to make 10 and seven. Or you could think about it as a doubles plus one, mm -hmm. eight plus eight plus another one. Or you could think about it as a doubles minus one, nine plus nine minus one. So if you hadn't experienced those particular names of those particular strategies, you wouldn't do well on that problem. Oh. On the other hand, at version two, Shelly, can I interrupt for just a quick second? Sure. The other thing to notice, right, is all we're getting is some colored circles if kids understand those strategies because they've been taught with that curriculum, but then we're also only getting the answer. And you're also having dealing with potential color blindness. Well, the colors of the crayons. That's true. Oh, mercy. So on version two. <laughs> <laughs> I've got color blind kids, so. <laughs> on version two, you would find out if they can solve those problems and what their strategy is for solving that particular problem because they're asked to explain what they did in their own thinking. So that gives me as a teacher a lot better information in, and a better insight into what's going on with that student. And then also another big aha I had last week with these revised assessments that we're using is I got a new student for the first time this year and he had not been there for any of the instruction obviously in my classroom so I wanted to know where is he on the third grade standards? So I was able to pull out that revised assessment because it only assesses the math. It doesn't assess the names of the bridges strategies that he wouldn't have been there to learn. So it was able to help me learn more about that student real quickly by handing him one of those assessments to try so that I could get a picture of where he is. Because the second model mm -hmm. assesses the math right. and the first model assesses not only some mathematical thinking, but mostly labeling. The curriculum, yeah. It's, it's how the curriculum addressed. Names of stuff. The names of those strategies, right. But, okay, so in version <coughs> two, tell me what, nine plus six. What could it look like? Explain so how you know. Do you wanna know what a student might write yeah. there? Yeah. They might write something like, I can make a 10 by taking, because they do learn those oh, strategies, okay. that I can take one okay. from the six and give it to the nine to make 10 and five, and that's oh, easier okay. for them to put together sometimes. They might say something like that, or they might say I started with nine and counted on six more. Oh, they, okay. they, so it just would give, and, and our students more and more since we've changed, even just with bridges, students are more and more comfortable with writing. They know they're gonna be expected to explain. To explain how and they write. got it. Mm -hmm. okay. So this was from the first assessment that we gave this year, which was the revised assessment. Um, so a few things to note about the revised assessments. They're shorter, which allows us to assess quick, quickly instead of taking two instructional days like the Bridges assessments take. So um, when we gave the Bridges assessments, they were spending two full days assessing. And um, they were four pages long. They were really difficult tests. Uh, then we narrow them down and found out what are the, the big ideas that third graders really need to know from all of this. And 
we were able to narrow them down to one to two pages to get more information from them than in the original assessments, which were so lengthy. Uh, now the tests take one day. Our, stu our students are happier. They don't look at them feeling overwhelmed. And you know we broke them apart because they were so long, but our students are just happier because they know that, oh, I can do this. Um, some other things to note here are just that this is analyzing the student understanding. So we're no longer just looking at our class average was 85% or whatever the class average was, but we're really able to look at what did this student know. So when we input the data uh, and then we went through this together and took a look at it actually with a bigger group of people too, these are showing the standards that were being tested for each of the questions. So you have this in your packet on the white page. I know on the slideshow it's really small. But if you look at the white page there, you can see student A and you can see the different standards there. Um, and it, it gave more information because of how we input the data. So we might have written how they wrote it on their paper so that when we're looking at the data as a whole, we can see those commonalities again and find where do we need to still go from here or what did, what did they master? What did all of the class master? So if you look at the bottom, we even totaled up to be able to see um, that the whole class mastered you know, this number, which is the standard, so we can move on from that. Does DM represent direct model? Yes. yes. Thank you. So <laughs> I went back till I found something that matched. Excellent, yes, you figured that out. So we do have a lot of different um, you know, initials in there that mean something to something us. Is this something you agreed upon throughout the district, or is this yeah. just at your school? So this is um, going back to the part of, we had a small group of teachers make some revisions to assessment. We're yeah. trying them in those classrooms. Oh, you're piloting and okay. <clears throat> but this chart was something Christina and I just did in order to analyze that assessment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. And I bet a lot of people were really happy to see this and said, <laughs> yes, we're taking this. Well, it makes sense only to us maybe, so. <laughs> oh, okay. Right. So is the intent eventually that, that George's team will craft on the dashboard something along these lines if, if if the pilot goes well and version two is really universally said oh yeah this is much better and universally adopted and agreed upon then will will that be able to be at at their fingertips so that they can input this you you developed a spreadsheet for your classroom so would it be a would this be something that would be looked at as as it would already been set up and they just have to input by their students their information so i don't know what i don't know about dashboards uh, and, but but i guess a part of part of me my head's kind of exploding at the question because um, one of the things that resonated with me as I sat in this summer, you know, listening to the group of teachers and, and having some conversations about what are we doing, um, Christina made the comment is, if I'm able to do this, I'm gonna know my students so much better yeah. um, in, the, in the moment. So I don't know how uh, George would be able to take this information in a really short period of time um, for all teachers across the district and get it back to them where they can use it. This is something that, um, these teachers have done so that they can take action tomorrow. I, all it, I'm asking about is a template because, I, I, you know, it's like they've developed a template, so we're going to have 60, you know, every teacher spends time developing a template. Uh, the I see what you're saying. So The spreadsheet. And all of a sudden you've got, you know, yeah, so we, a lot of time, a lot of effort by each <laughs> teacher. Right. And if there's a template that can be made available that's agreed upon, then how they fill it in and whatever, but it's a template so they don't have to sit there and go, oh, you know, yeah, so part of, formulas in. <laughs> part of the work of, yeah. of, the, of doing this is creating these, right? So this is a standard, this, right. Jody Garino, who's um, supporting us from OCDE, the coordinate, math coordinator of OCD, helps put these together. Um, and so, yes, if, if the question is, would we want to standardize a template, um, we would want to do that. For yes, okay. for sure. But then do you really learn, you know, where your student is at if you're just plugging in numbers? You're not, so again, the, the template would be, so imagine all of their information is out There's of this. It would just be the, the, the template so that we, they would know that they would need to analyze their students uh, specific to those areas being assessed. 
But each teacher would put their own information based off of their kids' understanding in it. I see what you're saying, that that would be very helpful to, have to provide that to other teachers to use the way that Christina and I use it without everyone having to make it on their own. Yeah. yeah. Why, why reinvent the wheel? You've already right. Yes. But what, what I see is really interesting, and I saw this more at your, you have your monthly PD. Is the that, fellows. That yeah. A couple of us attended. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm is that the teachers then can, they get together and learn what somebody else is doing and can see a great idea and pick it up, which I, I mean, you could see it happening there, that this is the way we do it. Oh, that's really cool, and yeah. Yeah, having the time to do that is, is really important. We do it between just the two of us constantly, like this student did this today, how do you think you know, we'll ask each other for advice. So how do you think that I should address that tomorrow? Or what question would you ask the student? What do you think? That kind of a thing is, is really important because two heads are always better than one. <laughs> <laughs> but also what we wanted to talk about with this, just this information and how we use it. Again, we would use it to look at individually. Maybe the student didn't get the correct answer, but how close did they get? Mm -hmm. how, what were their, what was their thinking up until the point where they made a slight miscalculation mm -hmm. or or something and how can we address that with those students and and looking at intervention as well not looking at intervention anymore as let's pull some kids out of the classroom and have them go do some remediation somewhere else but how can we within the classroom position them in a way with other students that can help move them forward and also going back to those principles of responsive instruction you know positioning students as competent sense makers we always have those students who are really struggling you know, we, ever, we always have one or two at least who are really having a hard time with, with the third grade standards. And this is very helpful to be able to look at those particular students and go, okay, where's a problem that, sh that she was almost able to get to the correct answer? And then having her, as if we do a sharing of, with the class of that problem, we would bring that student up and have her share what she did up to that point. And then, okay, let me have someone else come in and how, how would, did you finish the problem from that point? Mm -hmm. And that positions that student as competent. Mm -hmm. She had some thinking that was valid and, and that everyone agreed with and, and we've done that. And we've seen really big changes in the attitudes towards math and the self-concept of themselves as mathematicians. So that's something really exciting. And just in teaching this way in general over the past year or two, just the general enthusiasm and comfort level and and excitement towards math with our kids has been a big, there's been huge growth in that, so that's exciting. I'd like to share a story if that's okay. I have mm -hmm. one student in particular who's one of these students who really struggles uh, or who has really struggled in the past and probably did not have that higher self-esteem in regards to his math ability. And um, I have watched him just blossom, uh, changing from a student who really wasn't attending to the conversations. He wasn't participating as much and those norms of, you know, they kind of guide them into being responsible to have to participate. But I have seen him go from looking around the room to all of a sudden his hand is up every single time. Wow. And he's so excited to share. I had a teacher come to my classroom last week during recess time and she said, I just have to share with you about what Danny just told me. And he had come up to her and he just started explaining all of this math that he was understanding with fractions. And mm. she had this student um, previously, in previous years, and she knew the struggle that he had. And so she was really excited to hear how much he had grown in his math and just in his confidence of it. And he's such a sweet little boy, he uh, starts to giggle when he gets it. So you can tell that he's understanding it because he gets really giddy and starts to giggle like, oh my goodness, I've got it. And it's, but it's, it's that enthusiasm that we see changing in our classroom and students no longer coming in feeling like, oh my goodness, this is math time and kind of shutting down. Mm -hmm. And we've had that in the past where we've had some students who um, they had not been positioned as a competent sense maker of their math, and I was probably guilty of doing that as well. And so it's really changed our classroom environments and in their um, confidence and just seeing them gain that confidence and developing that love of math that when they came in, some of them did not love math, and there's still a few that I'm working on. But for the most part, most of them really get excited about math. Wow. And the other big change we've noticed is just with, with these norms and the level of conversation that they have about math. You know, it used to be that 
they would you'd walk into a classroom during math time and you'd see kids silently working solving problems it's not like that anymore in our classrooms there's a lot of talk mm -hmm. talking all the time and we've noticed that they're very comfortable being wrong you know if they don't think that if they don't agree with what the most of the class is agreeing is the correct answer they're okay with staying in that place and saying I still think it's this, I don't understand. Where before they would say, they wouldn't say anything or they mm -hmm. would just go along with the mm -hmm. rest of the group, but they're comfortable in, in expressing that they don't understand it yet. So that's great. That's huge. Yeah. That's huge. I'm, I'm so I think enough said there. That's probably a good segue uh, in, into literacy. But you see, um, we still have an enormous amount of work to do in relation to um, supporting uh, this this change or this this direction and this vision for instruction, um, but we're headed in the right direction um, in making sure that students are at the center uh, of the learning um, and that we're only building on what they're bringing um, and what they're understanding. So with that, um, I'm going to move it on over to Kathleen, who's going to make a quick, I think, change of screen, and we'll get into some literacy. Okay, well, she's changing. Is there an extra? I, I, I don't have one, that one. The science of reading? <laughs> yeah, my, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ladies. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, good job. Um, I'm I know do you want to go? Yeah, go ahead and go. Yeah. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm excited. To be here today to talk a little bit about what Ed Service is doing in the realm of foundational skills and the science of reading. Um, I've been very fortunate to be working alongside the TOSIS for the last few years as we're growing in our knowledge about really what it means to learn to read and that science of reading. And it kind of culminated this year in which we have a lot of professional development for our primary teachers that I'll talk a little bit later on about what that looks like. Um, but I also have um, an Adams team here. Oh, it's Stacey Howard is the principal. <laughs> Suzanne An Anholt is the TOSA at Adams. Mm -hmm. Sarah Manso is a kindergarten teacher. And then Savannah Anal, did I say that right? Anal. Oh, no. <laughs> okay, is an interventionist teacher. And really, I'm going to be providing kind of a, a brief background of what we're going to be talking about. Mm -hmm. But they're going to be talking about the boots on the ground, mm -hmm. how they progress monitor so that they can meet students where they're at. Mm -hmm. So when we're talking about reading, um, one of our milestones for our district is making sure that all students are reading by the end of third grade, reading fluently and they're comprehension, comprehending so that they can access that complex text that we know they need in uh, future grades. However, but we want to know what that looks like. And um, Dr. Scarborough has a graphic, an image, of a rope, and it's called Scarborough's Rope, which kind of illustrates, it's a metaphor, for what students need in order to become skilled and proficient readers. And all of those strands are necessary, all the language comprehension strands and word recognition strands are necessary for students to build so they become skilled um, readers. And if any of those strands are weak or missing, um, then that, comp that compromises the strength of the rope. And so really when we're even in the elementary or in the primary grades, we need to be working both on the language comprehension as well as the word recognition piece of the rope. Um, and the um, illustration also kind of shows that in the beginning, the primary grades, in preschool K, one and two, they, those uh, strands are pretty much developed separately. 
So the language comprehension strand, we're not ignoring, but we're developing those complex text, access to complex text, vocabulary, content knowledge, but we're doing that through read alouds from the teacher, because we know the, the students aren't able to read that at that point. Um, and where they are also focusing is this word recognition piece, which I'll be getting into a little bit today. I'm going to briefly go over some of it, but then hand it over to the team here. Um, so one of the reasons that I had put this slide in is, is a couple reasons. Um, as I'm growing in knowledge about reading and really what is best for students, um, I realized that I didn't have this knowledge when I became a first grade teacher. I, my first year as a teacher was a first grade teacher. And I wish I had had this knowledge when I, you know, in my pre-teaching uh, learning, in, in my gra uh, graduate program, I did not have this knowledge. And also Anne Leone, who has been our trainer for the uh, science of reading, uses this graphic to explain um, why it's so important that we have systematic phonics instruction. Because if you look at this um, image of the brain, there's a phonological area of the brain, the, the front left part of the brain, in which it's all about the spoken words. And we're pretty lucky because children are born with this, the ability to learn spoken uh, language if they are immersed in language. They learn it naturally. Again, with the orthographic portion, the processing of the brain, which is the back left of the brain, those are the visual images. Mm. And students come, or children, I should say, because they're not students in this part. <laughs> um, children are born with the ability to recognize faces and images and objects. And so that's also very natural. What isn't natural is when we combine those. Because we know that in phonics, we're combining the sound of the letter with the actual written written letter. And that's the middle of the brain. And we know that that needs to be uh, trained. We call it training the brain. And we also know that you know, reading is about it's, um, a code. That we know that a, a word represents a sound. And we want to teach students how to crack that code. And so a lot of that has to do with the middle part where we're connecting the two and tra training the brain. So that really has to do with a lot of the foundational skills that we're working in in the preschool to third grade. And I'm going to talk really briefly, but kind of give you a progression that what the essential learnings in each of those grade levels really looks like. So for instance, uh, well, let's just start. The uh, foundational skills are all about print concept. How do we organize print on a page? What the letters mean? Phonological awareness is attributing um, the sound of letters, but all done in a spoken way, not, not attributing them to a written letter. Mm -hmm. Then phonics and word recognition, and then finally fluency. And if we look at print concepts, you'll notice the graphic in the top right hand corner. The darker the color of the graphic means that's where the emphasis is. So for yeah. instance, print concepts, really a big emphasis in preschool and kindergarten. When you get into first grade, it becomes less of an emphasis, and they should have it mastered by the end of first grade. So for preschool, concept of print, it's all about that features of print, a book. It has a front and a back. There's a title. There's an author. All of those things that we do with our children, that they are able to um, master that. Also, alphabetics and introducing them to the alphabet. And a lot of times we first introduce them through their name because that's what they're most interested in. But there's <laughs> letters all around us. And in preschool, what we do is we really are teaching them the letters through their environment, through signs, through you know labels on like cereal boxes or signs outside. We're really looking at what's in their environment to make it more meaningful. When we get into kindergarten, we're really looking at the knowledge of words and the knowledge of letters. And so here's a kindergartner who's learning that we read from left to right, that there's certain letters and or certain words, mm -hmm. and then there, there's spaces in between each of the, the words. Mm -hmm. When we get into first grade, like I said, this is less of an emphasis because we really want them to have a handle on that by the time they get to first grade. And when they're looking at print concepts in first grade, it's in context, probably mostly in writing, when we're talking about capital letters, and punctuation. 
Um, then we're look, going on to phonological awareness. And again, this is all the spoken words, symbols, and sounds. And the smallest <coughs> sound of a word is called a phoneme. And most of the work is done in preschool, kindergarten, some in first grade, but we really, by the end of first grade, we want them to have a really firm handle on the phonological awareness. So in preschool, for instance, we want them to blend and delete words and syllables. So we might give them two pictures. Again, we're not using words in preschool. We are just kind of doing it more pictures. We have a dog and a house. Mm -hmm. And if I ask them to blend them, it becomes a new word, which is a doghouse, right? Mm -hmm. Again, we also want them to um, orally delete the onsets of words. So for instance, I might have two pictures. And I might say to the students, OK, I, I say the word um, rice. If I say the word rice without the er sound, what picture rep represents what that is? So it would be ice. Again, with the other oh. picture, if I had the word leg, and I, if I delete the word l or the sound l, what, what mm -hmm. picture represents the sound that we have, which is egg? So really playing with um, language, that's a really big part of phonological awareness is that play, that's why we do lots of songs and nursery mm -hmm. rhymes, and really that playing on you know, Dr. Seuss books so that they're, they're learning through play. Can I ask a quick, um, so on the phonological awareness, I noticed grade one is, is green because you're still doing it there. But on print concepts, Grade one. I thought you were still doing print concepts in grade one because it's you not are. complete till grade. How come that's not colored in? I'm well, just... it's a little green, but what I, I guess why I did it that way is because it's not intentionally taught. It's more within context. So okay. you're, you're you're teaching the print concepts in the context of teaching writing, for instance. Okay, and it should be complete by the end of grade two or uh, entering. The beginning of grade two. Oh, entering grade two. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Um, and then going on to kindergarten, we're working more with those phonemes, like I was mentioning the, uh, the smallest part of a word, the sound of a word. For instance, I have the word bus, and the beginning sound is b. So I might show a bus and a ball and a mouse and ask students which of those um, pictures have the, a different sound in the beginning. So students are learning to manipulate and hear the difference in sounds. Mm -hmm. And then by first grade, it gets a little bit more complex, where we're looking at individual phonemes. For instance, the word nose are, is um, composed of the phonemes n, o, and z. And then so we might want students to blend that so they get to the word nose. Same with i and z. They come up the word eyes. Ah. And in our uh, progress monitoring, our benchmark and pro progress monitoring, we are using a cadence, which is formerly Dibbles. You might have heard Dibbles before. But the two um, assessments that we use are first sound fluency and phoneme, seg phoneme segmentation fluency to look at if we are um, on track with phonological awareness. Um, next, we're going to briefly look at phonics and morphology. So if you notice the top, phonics mm. really starts kind of in the, you know, in kindergarten. And we're really connecting that print, which is, for instance, we see a mouse, and we're connecting the actual letter, M, to the M sound, the M mouse. And that becomes phonics when you're connecting the uh, written word or the written letter with the sound itself. And by the time we get into third grade, we're really using, it's called morphology, where we're really looking at how we're forming words with prefixes and suffixes um, and root words. So kindergarten, we don't really touch on very briefly in preschool, but mostly in kindergarten. And then when we go into first grade, we're looking at uh, sound and spelling patterns. So they might hear the sound E. We ask students to say it, and then they read it B, and then they might look at other words like tree and C that also have a similar spelling patterns. And then they, we want them to read it in context. So we have connected texts in which they're reading those words, Dan sees a bee. And then lastly, to complete that training of the brain, we want them to write it. And so then that's where they're writing in, I see a tree. Um, by the time we're in second grade, we're looking at um, more uh, complicated 
uh, spelling patterns. As you know, the word A can be spelled a variety of ways, like in the word train. There's a different a variety of ways that we can spell the word A. Um, and then this is what I had mentioned with the morphology, that when we're by the time we're in third grade, we're really looking at those Latin suffixes. We're looking at multisyllabic words oh because gosh. the reading that they're going to be doing from then on is really dealing with multisyllabic words. So it's you know, really wanting them to learn to decode those words. So in our uh, Acadians measures, we look at nonsense word fluency to mm -hmm. understand how students are doing with their phonics, and also their oral reading fluency to see if they're able to decode and have word attack skills. And then fluency, um, this begins very late in kindergarten, um, but we really want them in kindergarten to be reading with purpose and understanding. By first grade, really looking at that accuracy. We're starting to do that ORF, that the oral reading fluency as, um, in, kid, in first grade to see if they're accurate with their reading. By second grade, we, all, we want accuracy, but we also want rate. Are they reading fast enough and are they reading with expression or porosity? We also use that word to say uh, expression. And by third grade, not only are they reading accuracy, rate, and expression, but they're using prose and poetry and reading that, that rate. Hmm. Um, and again, our oral reading fluency in our cadence measure measures and helps us progress monitor if students are on track with that. <laughs> and this is just an overview of the critical learning that students need in every one of the uh, foundational skills and where it needs to be complete so they can be successful in the next grade. And just I want to let you know what we're doing at, in Ed Services for the Science of Reading. Um, all first grade teachers, actually all kindergarten, first grade, and two second grade teachers by the end of this year will have some PD in the science of reading. So not only talking more about that, you know, the brain development and all of that, but how are they connecting the science of reading to what they're doing in the classroom? And we've already had so many positive response. We've, already, we've done it with first grade, we'll be doing it with kindergarten and second by the end of the year. But they're able to actually take what they're learning and apply it to the classroom the very next day, and they you know, raved about it. So they only have the science of reading in K1 and 2, and then first grade also had um, supporting students with dyslexia and reading problems so that they can know what is going on when students are having difficulty so they can support in the classroom. Mm. And then at the district, we're really continuing our education. As I mentioned before, the TOSAs, some of the principals and teachers, you know, really looking at reading some of the books on the updated research having to do with the science of reading. We're going to be um, participating in a book study with the OCDE called Know Better, Do Better. It's all about the science of reading by the Liebens. And then there's a P3 symposium uh, put on by the district that has to also do with the science of reading that we'll be doing. And what's exciting about this is that we're, as we're doing this at a district level and this, uh, County level, this has actually been a national conversation. Teaching students to read, we've been kind of, there's like, you're going to hear the reading wars, but all of that research is coming out and really supporting what we're doing in the classroom, that the systematic um, instruction is really important. But I can say that, but I, I'm going to turn it over to the team so that they can show you what it looks like and how do we teach those skills in the classroom and how do we progress monitors and know the students are doing getting the skills. I just have a quick question, I, because I'm not a former teacher. What are nonsense oh, words? So, uh, nonsense word fluency is an opportunity for us to really gauge a student's understanding of phonics. Oh. So it's not real words. Oh. So they actually have to decode and match the letter with the sound because we know many of our kids are whole language learners and they can memorize words. Uh -huh. So this really uh, ensures the accuracy of the oh. data of how the students are dealing with their phonics instruction. Ah, good idea. Mm. And so what's inter that's such a great question because what's mm -hmm. interesting for many of our students who are not confident in their phonics is they try to make them real words. Mm -hmm. um, and that gives you so much information right away. It's just a one minute measure that we take mm -hmm. three times a year. Mm -hmm. um, it eventually goes away as we become more fluent as mm -hmm. readers, but it's a great indicator of their phonics instruction. Okay, thank you.
Um, so I am so excited to talk to you about reading today. It is one of my most favorite things in the world to talk about, um, especially when we're talking about um, our little ones. Um, they have a special place in my heart. Um, and I am so um, privileged to support Adams Elementary and work with a great team of really intentional and thoughtful teachers. So what I'm going to do is walk you through our model and how we implement phonics at Adams Elementary and foundational skills and what that looks like. So when you think about um, major components of a reading program, um, you have foundational skills and you have grade level standards. But you also have foundational skills that's differentiated by need. Because we know not all students come in at the exact same place, especially in kindergarten. Mm -hmm. um, so we have students coming in with all different levels of understanding of how the language works. So what we have as well in our program is we have um, our comprehension work that we're doing with our students. So we have tools to address all three of these areas um, to help our kids to become proficient readers. So when you think about foundational skills and grade level standards, this is really happening through our wonders word work. Uh, this is um, part of our adopted ELA curriculum and there's a component almost every day that deals with phonics instruction, but grade level standards. Um, so even if the student is not developmentally there, they are still getting exposed to grade level standards and foundational work. The foundational work is also connected to the core instruction, the decodable readers, as well as the reading that they do that week in class. Um, foundational skills are also addressed developmentally at our site by a program called SIPS, and I know you're very familiar mm -hmm. with this program. Um, SIPS really takes a look at where a student is at right at that time, and we address the needs of that student. So a student could be coming in with just having an understanding of print concepts and no sound um, word correlation. Um, they could be coming in an alphabetic principle stage or a spelling pattern stage. Um, some of our kids come in even with a morphemic transformation, which is really that higher level reading skills and decoding ability. So what we do when we do that work with our students when they come in is we really want to know what their needs are um, because we want to address them not only grade level standards, but we want to address where exactly they're at. So all incoming kindergartners are placement tests through the SIPS program. And we also dibbles them, or Acadians, this is now known. I need to get mm -hmm. used to that new language. <laughs> um, and so we have two measures to really check to make sure we're placing students accordingly to their needs. Um, so when we SIPS placement test them, it tells us exactly what lesson we need to begin on and what kit we need to begin on. And I'll kind of walk you through that in, mm -hmm. in a minute. When, when do we do that? Uh, first three weeks of school. Thank you. Uh, we try not to do it the first week of school because our kindergartners are really trying to acclimate to school. They're starting to realize they have to do this every day. You know that first week? <laughs> they're so happy the first day and the second day it's bawling because they're like, oh, I have to do all this again. Um, so we try to give the kinders a little bit of time. We usually test them the latest. Okay. We'll gather this information from the upper grades mm -hmm. to give them a little time to acclimate. Mm -hmm. Um, and then all new incoming students, even if they're sixth graders, we check their phonics. We really mm -hmm. want to make sure that we have an accurate read because it's never too late to go back and address those needs. Um, and we have systems in place to address K learner up to a sixth grade learner. And then that comprehension knowledge vocabulary that comes through our Wonders program, we won't be talking about that part of the reading rope today. Um, it is extremely important. Reading is not linear. Um, it is like gears working together. Um, so we're always addressing all the components, but really the foundational skills components is crucial in our primary years. So the SIPS model at Adams is a really thoughtful, intentional model. So as I was mentioning before, we placement test all incoming kindergartners, also all new students. And then through that, and then we take data from our existing students, knowing where they lost, left off. So when we placement test a student, they could go into some different categories. They could go into our beginning kit, which is first grade foundational skills, which is basically the alphabetic principle in their development. They could go into the extension kit, which is the purple kit, which is our sound spelling pattern. Um, and that's usually um, about first grade foundational skill levels. Then the red kit is called our challenge kit. That usually starts in second grade. We do not put students in prior to second grade because it's higher level word attack skills where we're working at polysyllabic and morphemic transformations. We're also looking at those prefixes, affixes, Greek and Latin roots as well. So we figure out exactly where students at 
and where they need to be. We collect all this data and we have two data points. We have their SIPs data and their DIBBLES data. Um, again, that is collected through the first three weeks of school. And then we start organizing them. Um, I wish I could say it's this really sophisticated high-tech system. <laughs> it is a lot of spreadsheets, um, really taking a look and thinking about um, our blocks of time, uh, all hands on deck. This is an all hands on deck approach. Mm -hmm. And then we just start breaking students up into their needs and their groups. Mm -hmm. um, our goal is to make the group as small as possible. But as you know, we tend to start having pockets of kids that all test mm -hmm. at the exact same level. So our goal is to really be thoughtful about where we're placing those kids. While so these groups are fluid, and we'll talk more about mm. that, but I might be doing less than 15, Sarah's doing less than 15, but my group just mm. needs a little more time. Mm -hmm. Her group needs a little less time, and so we might swap kids. Um, Does this include TKs? Are you including TKs? We do include uh, oh, okay. TKs in the model at Adams. Okay. Yeah. Um, and if you're ever having a bad day, Please come by um, and see it and work in action. It's just the cutest thing you've ever seen. Um, and so when they're, we're planning our groups and seeing them work, then we thoughtfully place them with a teacher. So for the kinder block, we have a kinder block, a first grade block, a second grade block, and a third grade block. We have six hands on deck, six sets of hands, which is great. Um, because then we're really able to be thoughtful and intentional and keep our groups small. This, again, is all placed on data. Then, as we're doing our instruction, we start that fluid movement where we talk to our peers and our colleagues about how that's really going, and does this place, placement make sense for the students? Mm -hmm. So there's always a constant conversation. We know kids grow so quickly in the beginning years. They're not learning foundational skills just from us only. They're learning it through their primary teacher, through families, cartoons. They're mm -hmm. always exposed to the language, and so there's a great growth that's happening. Then um, instruction happens, it happens in a 30 minute block. Every child is participating in that 30 minute block. There is no independent working happening at that time. Everybody's in a group, mm -hmm. which is fabulous. Mm -hmm. When you think about foundational skills, it's really, it's direct instruction. It's a highly routine based instructional model. So it is a lot of um, wrestling with mm -hmm. language. It's really about giving them a specific tool and making sure they understand it and utilize it. Um, also, when we think about the grouping too, we want to think about the positioning of the students um, and really making sure we can see them articulate the language um, and making sure everybody participates. And we're going to share a little bit about what that looks like too. Mm -hmm. um, and then the intervention team rotates to their next grade level. So we have this constant rotation happening. Of adults. Of adults. Mm. that are working with these kids, um, with these students, and really helping them to optimize their foundational skills and not only learn it, but apply it in the fluency. If you think about it, foundational skills is not the goal to be a great SIP student. The goal is to be a great reader, to be a great writer, to be a great speller. Um, you know, I think of my own upbringing. I was a whole language kid. Um, I grew up in the South. Um, there wasn't a lot of phonics instruction in my learning, and that became, and I was a very strong reader, mm -hmm. um, but became very apparent in my spelling. Mm -hmm. my, sometimes my spelling was so off, I couldn't even locate a word in a dictionary. <laughs> and I was a really strong reader. Mm -hmm. um, and so just really in my own life, it revealed the fact that I didn't have phonics instruction, mm -hmm. and I had to go back and learn it as an adult. Mm -hmm. oh. And now the language makes so much more sense to me. I'm like, oh, that's why. That's the role. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're really giving kids a leg up and understanding how the language functions so that they can be um, really proficient readers and it's gonna make sense why they're doing what mm -hmm. they're doing. So we're gonna take a little bit of a kindergarten spotlight right now. Mm -hmm. And uh, Sarah is a fantastic teacher at Adams and she's gonna talk about what um, the foundational skills program looks like. Mm -hmm. Or I'm sorry, Savannah. Yes. Savannah is gonna <laughs> talk about um, what foundational skills look like in small group for SIPS instruction. Savannah is an interventionist at Adams. Hi, my name is Savannah O'Neill, and I'm grateful mm -hmm. to be a part of the Adams team. This year, I'm oh. currently working with four SIPS groups, ranging from kindergarten to third grade. My first group that I will be talking about today is my primary focus, which is my kindergarten group. And what's really nice is we do start right at 8.30, so it's the first thing we get into SIPS. Um, oh. How I start is I have seven students in my group that are thoughtfully placed around my horseshoe table. Which you can mm. see here in the photo. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, this was just um, taken yesterday. <laughs> this was taken yesterday. So in October, we started at Lesson 21, and now we are at Lesson 42, which is great. 
we um, always start the day by rereading the previous lesson story. Then we move into phonological awareness, phonics, sight words, uh, reading a story, which is the new story for that lesson, guided spelling and segmentation, and lastly, fluency, which ties all of these components together and actually lets the student apply their skills. <coughs> um, with SIPs being a routine-based program, the students are always able to predict what's next, hmm? um, which is great. There's no surprises. There's really no room left to even mis misbehave because it's just it's a really <laughs> fluid process. Um, it, also, with it being, you know, having the students where all the responses are done correlately, a lot of students that perhaps wouldn't speak up in a normalized classroom setting are the ones that feel like they can because everyone else is contributing to it. Mm -hmm. I, um, I will show you a routine. I'll, sh I'll do with Ms. Manso a routine of how we introduce a sight word and then also how we go over the sight words that we've already learned from the past lessons. So I'll sit down. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, I have them here. So this is going to be our pretend new word. I'm introducing this. I'll first, I'll read it in a sentence. Why don't you so, do, why don't you do it with Martha? Oh, okay. oh geez. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> my hardest word here. Okay. So first of all, I want you to know on the back, I have my sentence with that word underlined, so word underlined. And then we also have a printout that we put mm -hmm. on the whiteboard where mm -hmm. we circle the words so they see it in a sentence. So I would say, I like to look at the picture. Then the routine that we use is we spell, we spell, we. So when I say we, you say we, when I say we. Okay. Read. Look. Spell. L. O. O. K. Read. Look. Spell. L. O, O, K. Read. Look. Yay. <laughs> Yay. 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 Good job, Yay, Martha. Martha. <laughs> we then move on. This is my pile currently. I love oh, wow. One. But okay. we'll just do one more with you. Yeah. These are now the reviewed words that we've already, we've already done in our past lesson. So the students should be familiar with these, which is why the routine is a lot smaller. It's just we spell, we now it's very simple. Okay. Oh. So um, uh, read. <laughs> Over. Spell. O. V E R over. Great, and then you move to the rest oh, of the pile. Okay. Uh huh. So, and this is what the pile looks like. So, does every student in the in your do all seven students in in the group mm -hmm. do the exact word, or do yes. they or do they move through the words and? So we do all of these review words together. Okay. Okay. So it's everything's done corally. Yeah. So all students really participate, like I said, without feeling singled out. Mm -hmm. And then uh, once. So the whole board should have the been whole board answered. Should have been <laughs> yeah, yeah, I got it. Yeah. Got it. I forgot. I had seen. I've seen it. It's awesome. It's yeah. amazing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And then, I, as you can imagine, the sight words do add up. Yeah. As you go through the lessons. So, yeah. I mean, if I kept all of them, the pile would be more like this, which we do wow. not have yeah. for. So we just slowly go through. I slowly start eliminating the word, the cards that we I know they know. And I actually made up a song. So we say, goodbye, my cards. <laughs> I'll miss you. And then we retire them back into my filing cabinet. Very organized. And move on. So... So that's our that's the oh, that's the process that's for introducing a new sight word and um, Savannah. Can I yes. just add to that? Yes. So um, it is so highly restructured and routine based. Mm -hmm. to this particular program, mm -hmm. your personality really doesn't come out in this program very much because it is so routine based. Mm -hmm. um, there's instructional routines and there's also correction routines. So when a student makes a mistake, you have a very specific way of correcting that mistake mm -hmm. because that's how you want them approach decoding and phonics work in their reading. Um, and then also because it is choral response and you always have a friend who loves to be first. Mm -hmm. um, and then we have a friend who always is like a half a sec second later because they're unsure and they want to make sure they're right. Um, your finger becomes the conductor. And so when she's doing the read, spell, read routine, it is a choral response. But her finger is letting them know when to go. And so it's not just shouting out. And so it is a really highly routine based program that really allows every student to think. And you might even pause for a moment to give them a, a moment to think about that word, and then you're just going. Then you're really looking for automaticity. So um, when Savannah's going through those cards, she's going fast mm -hmm. in that practice because we want it to be an instant three-second recognition mm -hmm. because that's what's going to be helpful for them to be successful in reading. Mm. Um, and so when you hear them, it's just this choral response. 
um, that is happening really quickly. It's not something that we're sitting and camping on all day because there's many components to the program. Um, so that's the way we're ensuring all students are participating and all children have a chance to do their thinking behind the work. I'll just share a couple of student success stories. So I had a student in the beginning of the year who just needed a little more practice with the routines and now is not only the best at the routines, but makes sure that all of her friends <coughs> are also very up to date with those routines and definitely lets them know when they're not. That's um, dark. <laughs> and then another student was um, at Adams last year as a TK or she came in not knowing any letters or sounds. Mm. Now, not only does she know all of her letters and sounds, she's in the highest group, SIPS group, at Lesson 42, and wow. she knows 61 sight words. Wow. So it's incredible. It's been, yeah. it's, it's been such a pleasure to work with my team and these students in this program. And thank you for your ongoing support with SIPS, and hopefully I can share more success stories with you that's in the future. Great. <laughs> yes, that's great. That's good modeling for the other that's great, it is. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, it's important to note that in that room, it's magic. We have three, uh, we call them our star team. It's um, success, we have a career. We're trying to get the word intervention. Well, six is an intervention, it's our core. But they're our star team. And so there's three star members in that room with groups of kinders, first grade, second grade, third grade, but groups of kinders all in action, all day long, mm -hmm. for that half hour, along with Ms. Manso, Ms. Wheeler, and a couple of our aides in the kindergarten classrooms doing SIPs also. So it's a well-oiled machine, and it runs beautifully, but our STAR team is amazing, so um, it works very well. That's great. And I think such the benefit is the students are getting exactly what they need. Mm -hmm. um, it's a really thoughtful and intentional instruction. Um, and so we're always checking in to make sure this still makes sense for them because they mm -hmm. are growing. So we have six mastery tests a year where we look at their blending and we look at their sight words. Uh, and in the very beginning year of kindergarten, we're also looking at their letter name, their ability to name letters. Um, so we're constantly monitoring that progress. Um, and really what we're looking for is mastery. We're not just looking for progress. We're looking for that 80% mastery, the specific skills. Um, if not, then we're taking opportunities to go back and reteach. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about the ways we do that um, because we know all students are not going to hit their mark at the exact same time. Mm -hmm. So how are we managing that process as well? Uh, something else I wanted to do to take a look at is how another way we're addressing foundational skills is wonders word work. Uh, this is our adoption. Um, this is the phonics um, curriculum that comes right into the program that is um, connected to core. Um, this is aligned to grade li level standards. So this isn't particularly where a student is at, it is um, where their grade level is at, if that makes sense. So you might have a student who's participating in this work that might be below the grade level standard in their own understanding at this point in their learning. You might have a student who's above. But as teachers, we uh, need to make sure that they are being exposed to grade level standards mm -hmm. because we are really charged to making sure we're teaching the standards. So we can really assure every parent that we are teaching grade level standards as well as meeting them exactly where they need to be. So if a student is above grade level standards, they're getting that exact same work in a small group, but on a higher level. Mm -hmm. um, so we really feel confident we're addressing every child and really where they are in their needs, in the phonological skills. Do you ever mix grades? It, I mean, in, in the small group, SIPs? Sometimes we do. Um, okay. you know, sometimes there's, there's outliers, and yeah. so you might have a little kinder yeah. who's just testing really high. Yeah. Um, and then we'll be really strategic in making sure we meet their needs. Um, and so that's where a lot of collaboration and mm -hmm. conversations happen. Mm -hmm. um, we will never let a student languish in a group that doesn't make sense for them. Okay. We're very, very committed to that process. Um, and so uh, Sarah is here to talk a bit a little bit about the model of Wonders Foundational Skills um, and also that this is a whole group work, so we're no longer working in small groups, we're working with a whole class. And uh, Sarah works her magic with her, this is her kindergarten class. Oh, I thought she was gonna talk right there. Oh, she is, okay. <laughs> I didn't know it was a video. <laughs> Hi, I'm so excited to get to share with you how I use the word work components in my whole class instruction on a daily basis. Um, before I get started with the different components, I wanted to give you a little background to my classroom so you might be able to picture what it looks like or what it sounds like. Um, like Suzanne said, uh, we complete these components whole class or whole group. Um, in my classroom, I have 23 students, 10 of which are English only or English proficient, 13 are English language learners. And then in addition, during this time, I have two students 
from STC classes, a kindergarten STC class um, pushing in. Um, so the first component of our word work that we do on a daily basis, and we do it right when they come back from SIPs or their star rotation, is our phonemic awareness. So um, it's looking for the beginning, the middle, the end of a sound. It's adding a phoneme or a sound to a new word, which they can get pretty creative with. Um, then there's also phonics, which is where we introduce or review a letter name and letter sound of the week. And it was pretty hard to contain our excitement yesterday when we found out we not only had one, but two letters of the week. We're very excited. <laughs> our silent cheers were not so silent. <laughs> and then the next part is our printing or our handwriting, which we supplement with our handwriting without tiers, tools, and program. Um, and then the last part is our high frequency words, which are sight words and sips. Um, which we do the same read, spell, read routine that you practice with Miss O'Neill. Um, and with all of those components, I like to use the same visual cues or arrows to help orient their blending and reading from left to right. We do a lot of the same choral response mm -hmm. routines. Um, when we're looking at our shared read or our decodables, we're using that same fluency practice of sounding out our words or just reading the sight word that we've memorized. So a lot of the routines that they're practicing within their small group, they're able to apply during our whole class instruction, looking at grade level content. Um, and I think it's important to note as well, this work that they do in foundational skills also helps them to be successful in that week's story um, and that week's decodable. So it's really aligned to the core. So it really is, serves an important role in students' um, development as well of understanding the curriculum that week. Um, and so that's where it's going to be really spotlighted and worked on. Um, so when you think about uh, phonics, we know not every language is a phonics-based program or, or a phonics-based language. Um, uh, languages like Turkish, um, Finnish, Italian, uh, even the ancient language of Latin are all phonics-based programs. Mm -hmm. So if we were learning a different language, uh, an orthography language like Chinese or Japanese, we would take a totally different approach to how we were learning this language. But because we're an alphabetic principle language, it's really essential that students have this knowledge to be successful, um, even all the way up into their adult years. Um, it's really important for us. We've been trying to th change our language from whole child to really whole person um, because really this child is going to grow up and be a person who needs to be literate in this world. Mm -hmm. um, and this is really where we feel like we're really giving kids, every child, based on not discriminating on their learning um, preference, but really giving them a solid core and foundational skills that help them be successful in reading. Um, so something that is really important in this foundational skill conversation is the collaboration. Um, so what we're gonna do is just talk about our collaboration model and what that looks like, and then also some data that has come through um, from our collaborations. As you can tell, we have fabulous teachers and everybody's working very hard to meet the needs of all of our students, but we're having a hard time. We do have time build out in our schedule for PLC for our grade levels. Our star team is always busy, and so this year we've tried something new in the fall, which we found very successful. We carved out two half days where our star team covered classrooms and we met together. So the kindergarten team, um, Savannah, Melissa, and Trisha met with, with, with Sarah and Amy, Sudan, and myself. Um, we sat down, we looked at the data we had, which was, that was in December, so it was more from the beginning of the year along with some of the mastery tests to see how are our students doing? Are, are, we, are we doing what we need to do to make progress for them? We also talked about just students in general. So we had some guiding questions. Have we seen any growth? That was hard for us to monitor at that time because coming up in two weeks is our next benchmark. So after, um, we'll, our, our next steps in March is to look at that data. Um, but we looked at progress monitoring some of the SIPS mastery tests. Um, are the students placed appropriately? Are our tools working? Are we using the right tools with each group? Is there something else we can be doing? Students' concerns, behavior. Are there other issues going on that other people should be know, aware of? Do we need to give more high fives? Is this child going through something? So we make sure everybody knows the story about each child and then just discuss regrouping opportunities. Schedule. Don't forget to be schedule on too. Um, and through that process, we spent two and a half days of, I thought, phenomenal time talking about students and what is our next steps. We had a lot of different, we made changes not only to regrouping, um, and I know we'll talk about distributed practice in a minute, and that's also some of our data points. Um, we also um, talked about 
about what, what can we do to continue to include that SIPS routine. We were using a different model for our, our um, letter naming and sounds, and so we changed SIPS routines and we started to see if we could practice. We realized there's a couple of kids we need to retest because the data we were seeing didn't really match what was happening for this child. An example would be a second grade student who grades were okay, he, he was passing all the SIPS masteries, he was, starring, he was scoring a preprimer on the star. So we had one of our star teachers go over right then and there, test that child, tell him, this is an important test, we need you to do your best, mm -hmm. and he came out at 2.0 at grade level. Wow. And so it's just making sure we're, we're looking at each child individually. And this is not a kindergarten, but another success story, our fourth grade group we had in SIPS Challenge. Um, they were moving along really quickly, and the teacher was like, I don't think we need to be there anymore, I think we can move forward. We, the star teacher, Ms. Hoff, Mrs. Hoff, retested all the fourth graders in that group, which is, I believe, seven of them. All of them passed this challenge, so they moved into fluency. Mm -hmm. um, so we're not holding them back, but we're looking at those groups, and, and they're fluid. We can put kids in, move kids out. Our SAI teacher um, had nine kids in a group. We were able to form a new group because there was time in the schedule that we created. So those groups were smaller to meet those children's mm -hmm. needs. Um, but feedback from teachers is very positive. It gave them a chance to sit down and talk to our staffs and really become one team. And so I know in March when we meet, we'll be focusing on our year K MIS data, our STARS, the SIPS mastery, mm -hmm. um, and we're also gonna include our SAI teacher. She wasn't in the conversation last time, but she's an integral part of our team because she sees a lot of students with two or three interventions. Mm -hmm. So she needs to be part of that conversation. And I think it really solidified our all hands on deck mentality that this is a village, um, that we're really taking care of kids um, with the mindset that we're all invested in our mm -hmm. children. And I think it's so important to have that. Our intervention teachers are so wonderful, but they don't always necessarily get classroom time uh, or time with a classroom teacher to collaborate. Uh, often is, can I walk with you when you're going to the restroom? Or, um, you know, do you have five minutes here? Because our days are really, really busy. Um, so this is a really thoughtful time where we can really sit down, look at the data. Again, we never just look at one data point. We're looking at several data points to make sure all little indicators are making sense of where this child is at. And then reevaluating our tools, reevaluating group placement, um, and then also taking a look at where we need to go and, um, in the future. Um, and so I feel like the model was really successful in really helping us to solidify our understanding of where these kids have been where they're at currently, and where they need to go next. Um, I also think, you know, if you think about collecting data, um, you're looking, it's more like we're photographers. We're taking snapshots at different times in a child's life. Um, we're looking at different landscapes. We're looking at different times of day. We're also looking at different times of year. Mm -hmm. um, and these snapshots are really, when you put them all together, become a portfolio. And this portfolio is what we really look at to determine where a student needs to be, um, and then where they are, and we can celebrate all the things that they're doing really well, and then also determine any unfinished learning in that process. Um, when I think about our, um, our, our decisions that were made in that group, um, so something that we had a conversation about on a team with the kinder team was something called distributed practice. Mm -hmm. um, distributed practice is a learning technique, and it was actually in, um, designed by Ebbinghaus in 1895. It is an older practice. Um, and then it was also researched in the 1970s through some psychologists. Um, it's also mentioned in Natalie Wexler's books on the knowledge gap um, and a lot of other her articles. So we tried it, it's a very simple model. A student gets a concept frequently for very short times. So it's intermittent teaching where it might be a five or 10 minute session on one topic, but you might do it three to four times a day. Um, what we noticed in this conversation, this collaboration, we had a lot of kiddos who are still struggling with letter naming. Where it's not a basic literacy skill, it is the standard, but it's also an indicator of reading success um, in the sense of you need to be able to let, name the letter um, and be able to identify a letter name. So what we decided to do is this distributed practice model. Um, and I'm really pleased that we can share some data with you today that I think is unique. We've never shared this type of data, but also I think it shows the power in the process of doing distributed practice. Uh, so Sarah is gonna share out with student data one. So student number one came to um, our school the second day of school um, speaking Turkish only. Mm. Um, so you can probably picture September, there are more days crying <laughs> than there were smiling and laughing in September. Um, but she's come such a long way, and I think a lot of it's because of the consistent 
and systematic approach we've taken through the distributed practice as well. Um, but back in October, she could identify nine out of 26 lowercase letter names. Um, so then we began the additional afternoon review in December when I have someone pushing in. And each bullet point is kind of like the progression of what skill she's mastered. So um, then it went on to 25 uppercase letter names, 24 lowercase letter names. And then it's progressed now that she knows most of her uppercase and lowercase sounds. Definitely the loudest and proudest. <laughs> <laughs> so student number two, um, this is one that we moved around after meeting with the STAR team looking at the actual data. We noticed that he was having difficulty passing the phonics portion of the mastery test. He was fine with sight words. Um, so we decided to move him to my group where I had more time in my group to work on that. Um, and so as the progression of the data shows, he went on from learning 18 to 26 lowercase letter names. Then we started working more with those sounds. Um, and that also helped um, him improve with his blending. And so now he's meeting those SIPS mastery test components and um, is now working on sight words during distributive practice. So the distributed practice class. is just really short? Of it's four for five. my classroom. It can be five to ten. We're at five minutes. <laughs> mm -hmm. So they have their own little individual bags um, based on the assessment that we did a few weeks ago of which letter sounds that he might be lacking or it's just not to mastery yet. So he has his own little bag. I write on a post-it his target letter sound or maybe two sounds at a time. And then Miss Ann pulls him back for five minutes. She does the routine from the SIPs. Um, manual that Suzanne shared with us where this letter sounds mm -hmm. mm, your mm -hmm. turn, mm, my turn, mm. and then they review um, previous sounds that either he's mastered recently or maybe some that might boost his confidence as mm. well. Two or three times over that. Mm -hmm. Yes. In a day. Mm -hmm. day. Um, and distributed practice can be used with any skill. Um, so we use it for sight words, we use it for letter naming, also sounds. Uh, you could do it in math fluency. Um, it's really just short, intermittent um, exposures or encounters with a particular concept that students just need more opportunities to engage with. Um, so we all know we have students who they can see a concept one time and they've got it. Mm -hmm. um, but there's other students who absolutely are capable of getting that concept, they just need more encounters. So these this distributed practice process just gives them an opportunity to have more encounters with a particular concept that's really tar targeted, very specific, um, efficient, and it's multiple times a day. Mm. Yeah. Uh, so I'm gonna share about student three. Um, so at the beginning of September, he only knew three of his lower case names. Um, and then we began distributed practice process with him in a.m. and p.m., uh, morning and afternoon. Um, and so he went mm. from tw from 9 uh, to 21 and 19 to 24 uppercase. Um, and then we switched to letter sounds for distributed practice. And now he currently knows 10 mm. out of his 26. Wow. This is just progress made from December using wow. this particular method. So we're really pleased with the results. Um, and we really think this is going to help students to grow. Um, and uh, student four, uh, he was a TKer last year. Um, he knew four lowercase letter names in September. Um, we started a distributed uh, practice session with him in the afternoon. He went to knowing 22 lowercase, 22 lowercase sounds and names. Um, and then he went from 15 to 26 on 114 to 22 to 26 on 123. Wow. Look at that progress. Wow. Uh, finally, student five uh, started with three to 26 of his lowercase names on 919. We started in a uh, distributed practice process with him in AM and PM and nightly, so we had parent participation. Um, and Sarah, would you like to share a little bit about that? Mm -hmm. So this student in particular, he didn't go to preschool, so his first start of his education has been in kindergarten. Um, the parents are extremely supportive, so we kind of already started this. We didn't really realize we were doing distributed practice with him. Um, but we sent home flashcards at conferences, and the parents have been very supportive. They do flashcards just like five to ten minutes, make it fun at night. And so he's just really started to thrive. He's very confident. 
Um, and we're currently exiting them out of that afternoon distributive model because there's other students who might benefit more from it. Um, but he's really come a long way. He's blending his sounds together during our SIPs groups, and he knows now up to 24 lowercase letter sounds. Um, and he knows all of his letters' names, so he has now met the kindergarten standard for 1D um, in January. Yeah. So he is really on a great trajectory to um, mastering the skills that he needs to, to be a proficient reader. Um, and I think the thing that is so important when we're talking about foundational skills is um, that the whole reason we do this work is for them to get into all that beautiful literature, all that gorgeous informational text, to really understand and know the language <laughs> and its function of the language, which eventually starts to translate into their writing um, and then into their spelling. And there's also some research that is emerging that it helps with math fluency as well. So phonics really does play an important role in our brain um, and how we develop as readers. And um, it's been just such a pleasure to work with a team who's so intentional and so thoughtful about this work um, from the very stages of placing students to the instruction and really reflecting on our own routines and making sure we're doing the work we need to, um, to our collaboration and making sure that the groups are fluid and making sense, um, to the data collection. There's a lot of reflective, thoughtful work that's happening. Um, and so it is just, it's really exciting to see these students grow um, and watching them really flourish with their reading and their understanding of the world that they live in. And it's more important now than ever with all, everything is video and it's like uh, reading's kind of gone by the wayside. Video, it's audible, it's so, uh, yeah. I, I appreciate you all coming from Thank the you. best Thank school. You. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it was really a good presentation. Biased much? It's great. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Is this a pretty, I mean, you guys did an amazing job. Thank you. Yeah. Um, is this kind of what we have at our other schools? Or you guys, I mean, you did an exceptional presentation, but is this kind of what we expect from our elementary schools in general? Thank you. I, I have a question. It's that one student that was in TK last year but came to kindergarten with only five, four letters. What are we doing in TK? Can I, sorry. He wasn't in That student yes. in particular. In yes, um, that one student was in, was in TK. Yes, so that oh. one student in particular, right now we're currently in the process of assessing um, possible speech needs as well. So there's things uh. I think happening there with pronunciation that maybe didn't carry over and there's also that summer reading loss some of our students um, mm -hmm. after they leave in June mm -hmm. sometimes they're speaking primarily in Spanish so there can be some of that disconnect as well mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. fabulous 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 and I think that two things come to mind in terms of education for school board members you need to you need to um, submit for a workshop because translating the work you do for us lay people not counting you, Char. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> because you're not, you're certainly not, uh, you know, lay. But it's it's translating and making us helping board members understand the work 
and how, how, how it's being implemented. You know, we're adopting the curriculum, but we have no, you know, this is the only way we hear mm -hmm. how it's actually doing. Um, and I think that's really important so we can translate it. So I think and it, that these it's are, so these different are from the way we learned. Exactly. So that's exactly. And I think that not thank me. You all for taking time. And <laughs> I learned phonics, I learned right? Phonics, yeah. When did phonics go out? I mean, uh, I don't know. It, it happened around the 1960s. Oh, there um, you go. And the 70s, where there was a shift in the thinking. Oh, okay. Um, and we went to more of a whole language approach. My, my, all my kids, my kids were all here in this district uh -huh. when we had the crystal. That was, I think, one of the books is called the Crystal. And it was it was a whole it was whole language based. Mm -hmm. and then, the but they weren't yeah. supposed yeah. to. We weren't books. supposed to drop phonics. But yeah. nobody uh, said and that. And then the since then, several exist. programs have come out that address phonics. And so it was kind of the lack of the draw yeah. of what curriculum a school adopted and whether they were yeah, exposed. So certainly, one? phonics instruction has happened since then. It just wasn't as universal. Right. Um, so I think we're just make, we're just returning to the research mm -hmm. and really <laughs> ensuring that every student has an understanding of the language. Yes, great. Well, thank you for taking thank away you. from you. your thank schools you. to come to teach us. It and was sorry we're so late. We had a miscommunication this morning. So. Yeah. Hmm. Can oh, I have oh. a motion to adjourn? Please? I move to adjourn the meeting with respect and remembrance of the um, disaster that affected our district specifically. Is there a second? Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Thank, Thank you all.